10 questions. There are more 10 questions, 10 members. We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a Social Security Committee debate on motion 16957 in the name of Bob Doris on Social Security and in-work poverty. And I would encourage all members who wish to contribute or speak in this debate to press their request speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Bob Doris to open the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Convener of the Scottish Parliament Social Security Committee, I am pleased to open this debate on a report on Social Security and in-work poverty. Uh, I want to place on record my thanks to everyone who gave evidence to our committee or supported our committee visits. My thanks also to our committee clerking team and SPICE, as well as to our former committee convener, Claire Adamson, MSP, who helped instigate this particular inquiry. The committee embarked on this inquiry against the backdrop of the UK government's continued rollout of universal to credit, together with its plans to migrate many thousands of people in work and currently in receipt of working tax credits over to universal credit. Alongside this, the committee was aware of the rising number of people, including working families, accessing food banks, and the research showed a clear link between that rise and the rollout of universal credit. We know that the rate of employment is at a record high, but research by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation shows that the number of people in work and living in poverty is the highest on record. We hear that this disp disproportionately affects women, disabled people, and black and minority ethnic individuals. At the same time as the fall in the number of workless families, there has been low growth for men's earnings and increasing numbers of women working. In Scotland, 18% of workers are paid less than the living wage, 6% are on temporary contracts and around 63,000 are on zero hour contracts. The number of workers in poverty is increasing at a faster rate than the number of people in employment. Put simply, presiding officer, what this means is that people in work are increasingly likely to find themselves in poverty and that is a very worrying trend indeed. Of course, in work poverty is not just about social security. I've alluded to some of the issues in relation to that already. The research shows in-work poverty as a product of the economy more widely. Also, factors such as affordable childcare, affordable housing, and eliminating the barriers and additional costs faced by disabled people are all key factors. These issues go beyond the remit of the Social Security Committee, however, but are crucial in forming an overall picture. The Social Security Committee focused on the role of the social security system, and in particular, how universal credit may impact on low-paid workers. Scottish ministers have some social security powers, presiding officer, but other than the flexibilities provided by Scottish choices, the policy and rules around universal credit remain firmly with the UK ministers. In the main responsibility for benefits for working age people is reserved to the UK government and to Westminster. Now, in 2016, the Social Security Committee then undertook an inquiry into universal credit, and they made a series of recommendations. Despite some welcome changes, fundamental issues remain a problem today. This lack of progress is perhaps best captured in this committee conclusion that our committee this year uh, put on record. It is unacceptable to many uh, to make any claimant wait a minimum of five weeks before receiving the financial support they are entitled to under universal credit. We urge the UK government to urgently reform this design feature to ensure payments are made within two weeks of an application being made, as was the case under legacy benefits such as job seekers. Allowance. Now, presiding officer, an obvious and clear mechanism by which in-work poverty can be in part tackled within the social security system is to end the benefits freeze. According to Scottish Government research, welfare spending in Scotland was £3.7 billion lower in the year 2020-2021 than it would have been had welfare reform measures not been implemented. The biggest reduction is due to the UK Government's benefits freeze, which disproportionately impacts the poorest and weakest in society. It is the view of the Social Security Committee that the UK government's freeze on benefits must be lifted. It is not realistic to expect any Scottish government any of any political colour to top up or mitigate every UK government welfare policy to ensure the income of Scottish claimants does not drop in real terms. We were also disappointed that we were not able to get a UK minister to accept our invitation to give evidence during our inquiry or since. We are still pressing for a UK government minister to come to speak to the committee. I am sure the Parliament will agree that this lack of engagement is an unacceptable and disappointing situation. Now, during our inquiry, 
We visited Dundee and heard from those with lived experience uh, of in-work poverty who received universal credit. I would encourage members to read the testimonies that uh, are on record in our committee report, uh, but let me highlight one in particular. A man in, in work who had been encouraged to move on to universal credit and advised wrongly he would be better off. He, as he waited to receive his first UC claimant, he applied for an advance. He managed the repayment of that advance and the change to how his rent was paid. His local job centre then told him to approach his boss about getting more hours. No further hours were available. He was told he should spend four hours a day looking for work, but all the sites list listed offered the exact same limited amount of jobs. Presiding officer, our committee want to secure improvements for that individual and the more than 50,000 people in Scotland and work already receiving universal credit, as well as for the estimated 170,000 families in Scotland receiving working tax credits who we moved or migrated over to universal credit. Starting from summer 2019, they will be migrated from the HMRC's tax credit system to the DWP's universal credit regime and be required to make a fresh application for universal credit. Being moved on to universal credit represents a significant change for claimants, not just a significant cultural change, but a radical change of regime. The whole ethos of UC is very different from tax credits and the relationship that people require to have with the DWP is very different from the relationship that they currently have with the HMRC. The committee agrees that the managed migration should not proceed unless there is more clarity around what this will mean for those being expected to move over. It is the view of the committee that priority should be given to addressing the existing concerns with universal credit before seeking to move up to 3 million people currently in legacy benefits on to universal credit. And a key aspect of that new regime uh, is, is this, that although it has not been actively applied at the moment, a policy intention is that someone in receipt of universal credit could be subject to conditionality and potentially sanctions. That means losing money despite working more than 16 hours a week. It will require a claimant already in work to take active steps to increase their earnings as an ongoing condition of receiving UC. Now, according to the OECD, this is unprecedented internationally. Indeed, in work conditionality was the second most raised concern in our written submissions. Now, Russell Gunson of the IPPR Scotland told us, conditionality for universal credit includes in work requirements. So the onus is on the claimant to increase their earnings or hours. And I'm on to add the idea that it is the sole responsibility of claimants to increase their hours or earnings to satisfy the universal credit system bears no relation to reality. Pete Serrell from the DWP acknowledged that there is no meaningful evidence of the efficacy of in-work conditionality. He told us we do not have evidence at the moment about what could, could work and about the best ways of interacting with people in work. Presiding officer, Given that the WP has no evidence to support the development of in-work conditionality, and more fundamentally, the committee is opposed to the principle of attaching punitive conditions to those already in work. The committee does not support any extension of in-work conditionality. Furthermore, as tax credits administered by HMRC are not subject to conditionality or sanction, there's a strong case to be made for not only halting further migration of people in receipt of tax credits to universal credit, but also to consider the removal of tax credit support from universal credit altogether and continuing to use HMRC unless the threat of conditionality and sanctions are removed. Presiding officer, the recurring theme that our committee heard was that the relationship between the job centre work coach and claimants was crucial. This can be extremely positive, but to build that relationship makes an investment of time and the development of trust absolutely important. The PCS union, which represents many DWP frontline staff delivering universal credit, has expressed serious concern to DWP managers, including about in-work conditionality, and do not feel they are being listened to. The committee suggests the DWP pay much closer attention to the concerns that they raise. The committee believes that the dramatic reduction in the number of job centres at a time when universal credit is being rolled out across Scotland was also a serious error of judgment by the DWP. I know from my own experience, presiding officer, with the closure of Mary Hill Job Centre in my constituency, that this has impacted in hard fought relationships that were built up between work coaches and claimants. In some places, these, these relationships have simply been terminated. Our committee concluded 
or job centre closures that this has impacted on service and compounded the disconnect between many service users and the DWP. We believe there's a case to be made for the review of local access to DWP and other forms of employment support across Scotland to allow for a more localised and community focused support in place of an increasingly remote and digital by default uh, support system. Presiding officer, all of this is far preferable to the threat of sanctioning of the working poor. Supporting career progression for those in work without the threat of penalty is not only right, but it's likely to be far more productive. Now, uh, universal credit is paid monthly in arrears based on earnings during what is known as a monthly assessment period. Circumstances are assessed on the last day of that assessment period and earnings within the monthly assessment period are taken into account in that month's UC award. UC tops up earnings received during the assessment period in this way is intended to smooth out fluctuations in income. However, there are issues with this. For example, fluctuating incomes from month to month do become an issue in budgeting terms, but pay cycles more significantly differing from UC cycles. For example, people being paid four weekly or in the last Friday of the month and so on. Uh, where UC assessment periods and the job pay cycle are out of sync, the UC award can end up taking two paychecks into account one month and none the following. The committee has significant concerns about universal credit assessment dates not aligning with paydays, and we recognise the UK government is said to now be urgently looking at this. We agree that this must urgently be addressed and have requested an update from the UK government ministers following their considerations. Later on this afternoon, my summing up, I will raise a variety of other matters that are important in relation to the working poor and universal credit. However, presiding officer, for the time being, in my closing remarks for now, let me say it is essential that the UK and Scottish Government work together meaningfully and constructively whilst acknowledging respective policy differences. And on that matter, Cabinet Secretary uh, will note our committee made a case to review local access to DWP and other forums of support across Scotland to allow for that more localised community focused support. That means the Scottish Government must be able to demonstrate how it is seeking to work meaningfully in a strategic way with the UK Government to offer that community focused employability support and I would ask the Cabinet Secretary for details. The Scottish Government is also bringing forward proposals for a new income supplement. That must also take account of in-work poverty. We await details of this supplement and of eligibility criteria. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to outline what progress has been made on this and what we expect uh, will be a new social security benefit. Presiding officer, uh, I look forward to the contributions and suggestions from my parliamentary colleagues this afternoon and have the privilege of moving this motion in my name. Thank you very much. And, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Shirley Ann Somerville, to open for the government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking the Social Security Committee for bringing this important matter to a debate today and for their hard work during the inquiry itself. I welcome the opportunity to give evidence to the committee last year and I'm grateful to be able to contribute to, debate, to today's debate. The committee's report on in-work poverty makes for stark reading and shines a light on the urgency of this issue. The support provided by the UK government to those in low-paying work is simply not enough to make ends meet. Just last month, our poverty and income inequality statistics showed that after housing costs, 60% of working-age adults and two-thirds of children living in relative poverty in Scotland are from working households. Alongside record levels of employment in the UK, we've seen record levels of households entering in-work poverty. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation, in their tackling the rising tide of in-work poverty briefing, rightly highlighted that jobs that are low-paid and insecure, offering only a dead end and not a stepping stone to a better job, trap people in poverty. And that's why, as a government, we have committed to a fair work future, supporting the real living wage, opposing exploitative zero-hour contracts and helping families to work and earn more. As the convener has highlighted, the Scottish Government has estimated that the UK Government's cuts will reduce spending in Scotland on welfare by approximately £3.7 billion by 2020-21. The benefit freeze does account for the biggest single reduction in social security spending, around £370 million by 2021. The level of benefits has been frozen since 2016, leading to the support that people desperately rely on falling further behind the cost of living. 
We have repeatedly pressed the UK Government to lift the benefit freeze and for benefits to be uprated in line with inflation, but this has to date been refused. And it is impossible to speak about in-work poverty without discussing the impact of universal credit. Where previously people in low-paying work relied on work, working tax credits to help them manage, the option to make a new claim for tax credits is now gone and people are forced to turn to universal credit. As many of us will have seen in our own constituency mailbags, there is a growing mounting of evidence that universal credit pushes people further into poverty rather than helping them out of it, and the Social Security Committee's report adds to it. The five-week wait for the first UC payment is, of course, highlighted quite rightly by the committee as being unacceptable. The Scottish Government has made this point several times to the UK Government, as indeed have many organisations. And it is also worth pointing out that this five-week wait is the very minimum waiting time, with many people waiting much longer for payments. Unbelievably, the DWP told the National Audit Office that it's unreasonable to expect all UC claims to be paid on time. But when someone is forced to rely on the DWP for financial support, I fail to see how they can possibly justify that position. The committee also noted that there is a lack of information available in the DWP's plans for managed migration, hardly surprising when they keep delaying it. And in the meantime, people who naturally migrate to universal credit through a change in circumstances will do so without transitional protection, meaning that they will see their entitlement significantly reduced. I am deeply concerned that natural migration will hit households even harder than managed migration, households already struggling to make ends meet. And the longer the DWP takes to begin managed migration, the more people will find themselves moving to UC without protection. We've urged the UK government on numerous occasions to halt the managed migration until universal credit is made fit for purpose. Now, universal credit was supposed to make work pay, and a key part of achieving this was the work allowance. Work allowances let people keep more of their earnings before their benefits are reduced. However, the UK government reduced work allowances so that they are now only available to people with responsibility for a child or with limited capability for work. For everyone else, as soon as they begin earning, their benefit is reduced. This means more and more working people in Scotland are losing out as they move to universal credit. In its final report, the committee recommended the complete reversal of the cuts to work allowances, and I fully agree with that recommendation. I'd now like to turn to what the Scottish Government is doing on these issues. Unfortunately, we are limited in what we can do with universal credit. However, we are using the limited powers that we do have to make the delivery of universal credit more flexible and better suited to the needs of those claiming it in Scotland. Since October 2017, the Scottish Government's Universal Credit Scottish Choices has given people the choice to receive their award twice monthly and to have housing costs in their award paid directly to their landlord if they wish to do so. The take-up rate of the choices has been high and from November 2017 to August 2018, over 66,000 people have been offered Scottish Choices with 32,000 people, almost half, taking up one or both of those choices. This tells us that people do want more flexibility and adaptability in how they receive the support that they are entitled to, further evidence that changes to the DWP's benefit system are needed. We are also committed to introducing split payments for universal credit awards for couples. This will provide access to an independent income to everyone claiming universal credit in Scotland and will promote our values of equality, dignity and respect in the social security system. We are currently working with the DWP to carry out an impact assessment of two policy options and this will allow us to refine our policy proposals further. Despite this work, there is no doubt that the impact of the UK government's cuts are staggering. As I have said, cuts will amount to social security spending in Scotland being £3.7 billion lower by 2020-2021. We are already spending over £125 million this year to mitigate some of the worst impacts of the UK government's cuts and to support those on low incomes. This includes over £60 million to cover the cost of discretionary housing payments and continue mitigating the UK government's bedroom tax. £10.9 million worth in discretionary housing payments have been distributed to local authorities to help address the impact of other cuts, including £8.1 million in recognition of the impact of the benefit cap. It also includes £38 million on the Scottish Welfare Fund, which provides a vital lifeline for people in need, providing support through crisis and community care grants. 
As of September last year, over 316,000 households in Scotland have been helped with awards totalling £181.6 million. By the end of this financial year, the Scottish Government will also have provided over £1.7 billion in funding for the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. The Scottish Government um, is not here, however, simply to paper over the cracks of the UK Government's welfare cuts. We simply cannot afford to cover the costs of billions of pounds each year. I hear regular calls for us to cover the cost of further cuts, but no suggestions as to what we should scrap if we are to do so. To be clear, every pound we spend offsetting a UK Government cut means we cannot spend that funding on other public services and priorities. I want this Government to be able to invest funds in pulling people out of poverty. That is why we are working hard to develop our new income supplement, which will provide additional financial support for low-income families who are the most at risk from the impacts of UK Government cuts. But we risk all of that if the extent of our ambitions is mitigating the decisions of another Government. Something that the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Professor for Philip Alston, last year described as outrageous. Presiding officer, let me finish with some more words from Professor Alston, who said of the UK government's approach to welfare, compassion for those who are suffering has been replaced by a punitive, mean-spirited and often callous approach. He continued, successive UK governments have presided over the systematic dismantling of the social safety net in the United Kingdom, the introduction of the universal credit and significant reductions in the amount of and eligibility for important forms of support have undermined the capacity of benefits to loosen the grip of poverty. So I welcome the Social Security Committee's report. It is yet more damning evidence that the UK government's welfare system is simply no longer fit for purpose. And in closing, let me assure the Parliament that we will continue in the Scottish Government to press for urgent changes that universal credit requires. And we are committed to using the powers that we do have over welfare to build a system based on dignity, fairness and respect. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Michelle Ballantyne to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I commence my contribution this afternoon by thanking the committee clerks and all those who gave evidence to this inquiry. Whilst during it, um, the finalising of the report, I have dissented from a number of points and conclusions in the committee's final report for reasons which I will return to. It was an important inquiry because recognising that in-work poverty is a problem and committing to tackling it is the first step to ensuring that everyone who works can and should expect a better future. Last year's publication by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation on Poverty, Causes, Costs and Solutions, stated the following. The processes that cause poverty are complex. Simplistic explanations may focus on one factor, but solving poverty requires an approach that takes into account the impact of market and state structures as well as of individual choice. It is important then to acknowledge that this inquiry focused on one factor and in doing so has inherent weaknesses. The UK government, as part of its welfare reforms, has committed to ensuring that work pays. The introduction of universal credit was at the centre of that reform, with the aim of simplifying the benefit system and ensuring that individuals and families were able to escape the legacy of benefits that trapped whole households into generational worklessness. A legacy that has seen the breakdown of the social contract between taxpayers and those who needed support. A legacy that led to the stigmatisation of those who were on benefits, a position I hope we never see again. We know from Scottish Government figures that between 2015 and 18, 60% of working age adults who were considered to be in relative poverty were in working households. And that figure rises to 65%, equating to 160,000 individuals in the case of children. We also know that projections suggest that the overall poverty rates are likely to rise over the next few years. So what is the relationship between in-work poverty and universal credit? In the words of David Finch of the Resolution Foundation, it is definitely too early to say that universal credit is having an impact on the poverty figures, especially because it was nowhere near being rolled out to everybody when his original survey was done. And it is still nowhere near being rolled out to everybody. So it will take time before we see the impact. Russell Gunson of IPPR Scotland acknowledged that whilst universal credit and social security more generally have a big role to play in reducing and tackling poverty and in-work poverty, the economy and the income structure in Scotland, and of course the United Kingdom, 
will be as much, if not more, of an issue when tackling in-work poverty. Nobody disputes that universal credit has had its problems, particularly in the early days of its introduction. But in his evidence, Robert Joyce from the Institute of Fiscal Studies reminded us that the overall rise of proportion in people who are in poverty are, and are in working households has been going on for some time. In itself, it is not a phenomenon that is related to universal credit. More importantly, he stated, a significant group of working households will keep more benefits under universal credit than they would have kept under the old system. In that direct sense, universal credit will top up and increase their incomes, which would tend to in reduce in-work poverty. Part of the challenge of this inquiry was the fact that the rollout of universal credit full service was underway during the inquiry and only completed in December 2018. Yes, okay. Bob Doris. Mm -hmm. Valentine given way. Really interesting quote that you just gave there about, I feel like, winners and losers in, in relation to the new system. I wonder if you'd agree with me that in our committee report we had concern about the oversimplification of winners and losers under uh, the new universal credit system because those that lose tend to be the most vulnerable in society and would you share those concerns? Michelle Valentine. Um, interesting question, um, interesting use of the language that I understood as a committee that we agreed we wouldn't use um, the term winners and losers. I think that was something that you yourself called for, convener. Um, there is no doubt that some people will benefit more from the introduction of universal credit and others will benefit less or may indeed be slightly worse off. And I think I go back to my original point in the speech that we have yet to know exactly how that's going to look. Um, and I'll touch on something later on in my speech, which I think is important. No, I need to make some progress. Um, part of this challenge, um, as I said, we saw a number of, part of this challenge was about the, the overlap as we were having the inquiry. And we have seen a number of announcements and changes during October and January designed to address some of the concerns. But attempting to untangle the web of legacy benefits and tax credits, split as they are between Treasury and the DWP, is a challenge, something that the Westminster Social Security Advisory Committee have made clear. A key part of the flexibility of universal credit is its test and learn approach. Previously, when something was not delivering effectively within the legacy system, there was no ability to change it. Now, new changes are tested, problems can be identified, and solutions found. And I think that is a really key factor, particularly in relation to Bob Doris's question. Paul Gray, the former chair of Westminster's Social Security Advisory Committee, remarked that the committee had welcomed the stated intention to test and learn, and on numerous occasions it has lent UC a flexibility that is light years ahead of any process offered by the legacy benefit system. As I've vis visited job centres around the country, <coughs> this is an approach I have seen in action, and I know it is highly thought of by the DWP staff, who recognise that their input is listened to and acted on. Presiding officer, much of the division on this report um, often came down to a matter of words. For example, the use of the word many rather than some, in itself seemingly insignificant, but we believe it changes the emphasis of a paragraph and the story that it tells. And unfortunately, this inquiry was often bogged down in political positioning, with colleagues clearly identifying their position on universal credit and seeking answers to support their beliefs. I had hoped that we would all agree with the sentiments of Russell Gunston of the Institute of Public Policy and Research, who said in his evidence that bringing six means-tested benefits together in, on, one sing, on a one single taper is a good and positive idea, but the funding levels that were originally promised have dropped significantly. Whether universal credit will work or not has to relate to three factors, the structure, the funding, and how it is implemented. Our report calls for those funding levels to be restored. And I believe that the UK government has shown it is ahead of us, having already increased the levels of funding, not once but twice in the last two budget statements. When it came to the role of work coaches and conditionality, I did struggle with the evidence from PCS and found it to be politically motivated and could not support the conclusions that the committee chose to include. Recommending a return to the discredited system of tax credits based on no evidence received by the committee unless conditionality and sanctions are removed showed, in my view, a poor understanding of the system and, indeed, of the evidence we heard. Mm -hmm. As in any inquiry, it is important that we identify the problems and offer solutions, and many of our contributors did so. Giving his evidence to committee, Russell Gunson said, 
There is an argument about whether any conditionality is right, but we would say that conditionality, even a means test, is likely to be needed as, any part, as part of any system. Submissions from Oxfam and, ironically, the PCS both said that in-work progression could be positive if developed in a supportive way. Oxfam wrote, progression is fundamental in ensuring that work acts as a route out of poverty. But Oxfam does have concerns about how in-work progression policy has been conceptualised. Victoria Todd of the Low Incomes Tax Reform Group said, some people who are already working and who would have claimed tax credits, but who, because of their area, and now on universal credit, have had a positive experience of support from work coaches to increase the number of hours that they work, to look at other options, or to get training. The stories that I have heard are not all negative in that respect. And Kirsty McKechnie said, I will reiterate what Rob Gowans has said about it being a potential improvement on universal credit in the number of hours or different weeks. Um, because those who have fluctuating hours or perhaps have low hours, it used to be that there would be a cliff edge of 16 hours where you would no longer be entitled to job seekers allowance or employment and support allowance. There was a bit of a gap before you worked enough hours to get the working tax credit. That group of people will now be supported. But she agreed that applying sanctions might not help improve people's ability to either look for work or increase their hours. So, presiding officer, it is a mixed report, some of which I totally agree with, some of which I have difficulty with. But I think it is something that we need to keep monitoring. And when we contribute to the question of universal credit and in working poverty, it needs to be on a constructive basis because we have a test and learn approach that could improve it for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Mark Griffin to open for the Labour Party. Thank you, President Officer. Like my colleagues on the Social Security Committee, I'm grateful to see our report come to the Chamber. Once again, we're forced to consider the catastrophic impact of welfare reform, which is pushing working people into poverty. But you don't need to read this report to know how miserable the situation has become. Right now, almost 400,000 adults in Scotland are going out to work, but still living in poverty. Well, two thirds of kids living in poverty are in a household that works falling behind everyone else in society, making decisions about whether they can buy food or need to get a food parcel, and no doubt thankful for the, the, the mild winter that we've just had, and with people being terrified about the, the meter running out or that fuel bill landing on the mat. It's absolutely heartbreaking, and it needs to be fixed. Like the convener and others, I want to thank the, the clerks for the work on the committee, as well as um, the excellent evidence we received from a broad range of experts like the Resolution Foundation, IPPR, CAS and a, a range of food banks. And though this report is important, I'm doubtful that any of the, the mums and the dads getting ready for a night shift or heading to the, their second job of the day care, care much for yet more discussion. Um, what they want to see is, is action. In preparation for the inquiry, the committee made its usual call for evidence and we had just one written submission from uh, Sarah McLean, um, which came from um, an individual with lived experience of being in work and in, in poverty. And recently having moved to, to full-time work on tax credit, she told us, well, I love my job, it's something I'm passionate about. The recent changes to my working tax credits has highlighted that going to full-time work does not pay and bringing home only marginally more than when I was working part-time. She talks about the opportunity costs of that full-time work, which then become harder than the, the financial hit. I missed my daughter's last day of primary school because it was my first day at work. I was unable to take my son to his first day of P2. Overall, I get less time to spend with my family. And quite simply, you know, what she asks, are the extra few pounds a week worth going full-time? And that mantra of work being the best route out of poverty, um, we all agree something should be logically correct. Of course it should. But the simple fact is that the link between working hard and keeping your head above water is broken. And the report doesn't say it outright, but ultimately the committee heard that universal credit is not fit for purpose. It's plunging people into poverty, arrears and destitution. What the report does lay out, just as is echoed by Kaz and others in their briefing, is how people 
have been dragged through a system that just doesn't care for families' well-being or stability. We were told that UC would mirror the world of work and make it pay. But leaving people without income for at least five weeks or with salaries fluctuating wildly every month is simply state-sponsored malpractice that decent employers would reject up and down the country. The simple fact is that universal credit systematically fosters poverty. Even if you do manage to get a regular payment, you're hit with a marginal tax rate of over 70%. What's the point in trying to earn more when your tax rate is 70%? Philip Hammond's £1,000 increase in the work allowance is welcome, but it goes nowhere near undoing the 2015 cuts and the 2p reduction in the taper rate to 63p didn't do that either. The Tories are well behind the curve in this and that's why the committee report we stated the need, the need to restore the, the funding um, that was taken away in 2015. Yep. Michelle Ballantyne. Could, could the member say c clearly then whether he actually believes the legacy benefits were better for working people that were trying to get back to work, whether that be a single mum, than universal credit is? Did, did, is that what he's saying? Hart Griffin. I'm just about to come on to that and the point that um, the intervention that the convener made on Michelle Ballantyne and, um, was about how vulnerable people would be affected by universal credit. Michelle Ballantyne made the claim that we aren't quite clear yet on who is going to be uh, worse off or not. But what I can tell, tell you is uh, we do have figures for that. I would expect Michelle Ballantyne to want to know what the figures are. For lone parents, for disabled households without housing costs, they will be £1,940 and £1,220 worse off every single year. And would, I would expect the Tory benches to know that impact that, that universal credit is and will continue to have on vulnerable working people. In my region in central Scotland, 28,000 people have moved on to universal credit since the rollout started in October 2017. They're suffering from rent arrears which have quadrupled. They are having to pay back £11 million in advances at a rate of 40%. They face a brutal conditionality system which forces them to find more work. And constituents who have been in touch with my office recently have told just how aggressive and pernicious UC really is. One saw their tax rebate, that was income they earned last year and went unfairly taxed on, swallowed up as income and have their UC payments cut. Another had their UC payments cut and money now clawed back because the DWP failed to take account of their student loan payments that that student informed their work coach, put the information on their log as they're advised to do six months ago. Now, President Officer, our report looks specifically at the social security system, but it's hard to ignore the fact that Brexit, another mess of the Tories making, will have a devastating effect on those on low incomes. We might have stepped back from a devastating no-deal Brexit, but risks of price rises, falls in wages, lower employment and lower tax revenues will do nothing to stop pushing working people below the breadline. And we were t when we were taking evidence in the autumn, um, universal credit was one of the few things that actually cut through the Brexit fog. And this report rightly recognises much needed changes were made um, in the budget, but the 2015 cuts must be reversed in full. On that, the, the Tory members agreed, but littered throughout this report is a trail of dissent and opposition showing just how unwilling the Tories are to accept the impact universal credit is having on people across the country. But an important conclusion in the report is that social security is becoming a shared responsibility. In fact, it's almost a year to the day, President Officer, that the Chamber agreed to the Social Security Act. I've told the, the Chamber before, I was one of four children. My parents worked hard, my father is a welder, my mother, my mother is a bank clerk, to support the family that they chose to have. My dad was diagnosed with a serious heart condition at the age of 37 and was unable to carry, out, to carry on doing the work that he was trying to do and had been doing. For, for 20 years. And who plans for that when they start a family? Who plans for redundancy 
career-ending illness or even a death at 47? Where is the support network? Where is the state support that children depend on day in, day out, when circumstances change beyond anyone's comprehension? We can't mitigate every cut, we accept that, but refusing to act on the two-child limit and the rape clause is shameful. They call it mitigation, but people have to be assured that Holyrood will act and is better than this callous Tory government. And frankly, Scots don't care what colour of government provide that support. Presiding officer, this report is a starting point, but we now need to change, and where we can, MSPs must act too. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alison Johnson to open for the Green Party. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I too would like to thank all who gave evidence um, in writing and in person and the committee clerks and advisors who, who helped um, prepare this report. Presiding officer, poverty statistics released just a few weeks ago make for truly sobering reading. As we've heard, nearly two thirds of Scots children are in, who are in poverty are from families where at least one adult is in employment. That is almost a 20% increase over two decades. And that's why it's vital that we have a social security system that allows people to live free from poverty when they can't work and to support them into well-paying work with prospects when they can. Now, the committee's investigation focused on universal credit, which was designed to tackle in-work poverty. But too often, universal credit makes life more difficult for people in that situation. Universal credit has become too easy a target for governments trying to find savings. And as Michelle Ballantyne noted, the committee heard from IPPR Scotland's Russell Gunson that funding levels that were originally promised have dropped significantly. Now, the work allowances which allow recipients of universal credit to earn more before having their entitlement reduced were slashed in the 2015 budget. Now, some of these cuts will be restored as a result of the most recent budget, but not entirely. Some people face worse, less appealing, less attractive work incentives than before the cuts, and some, despite promises that no one will experience a reduction in the benefit they receive as a result of the introduction of universal credit, will still be worse off. And that's without taking into account the, the range of other cuts people are subject to, not least the, the four-year freeze on benefits and tax credits that arbitrarily freezes incomes at 2016 levels, meaning that real incomes reduce. No wonder then that many of the committee witnesses from, from food banks say that universal credit, along with other cuts, is a significant driver of food bank use. And after years of denying this, even the DWP is beginning to admit that this may indeed be the case. But one of the overwhelming messages that came through the evidence was that so many elements of the design of universal credit haven't taken into account the realities of what it is to be in low paid work, what it's like, and even worse, have flown in the face of advice that has been given. As far back as 2012, before UC was introduced, the Women's Budget Group warned the monthly assessment period would mean that many recipients would have difficulty in anticipating in advance the effect of changes of circumstances on their entitlement for the coming month. This would be a particular issue for claimants on low incomes who tended to have very frequent changes of circumstances. Fast forward seven years and those warnings unfortunately have come to pass. The committee heard that the monthly assessment period is causing myriad problems. Child Poverty Action Group and others have told us that where the universal credit assessment period and wages don't line up, there could be two monthly wages paid within the same period. And that means that your UC entitlement is reduced or withdrawn entirely. So the recipient has to reapply and can lose passported benefits like crucial support for school meals. So incomes from universal credit can fluctuate hugely. The group's rough justice report cites an example of a couple whose UC income over a six month period ranged between nothing, zero, and 1,200 pounds, with the people affected saying that, we don't know if we're coming or going from month to month. It makes budgeting so, so difficult because you just don't know what you'll get. So this is one of a huge number of examples where the UK government hasn't taken heed of evidence that was staring them in the face. The committee notes that the UK government has repeatedly said there are no plans to change the monthly assessment period despite the problems created by fluctuating UC awards. And even when they have listened, and I do accept that there have, 
you know, some positive changes to universal credit have been made, but these are often made years after the concern was first raised and after the damage has been done. So there is a lesson here for the Scottish Government in setting up the new devolved benefits. Changes to social security need to be based on expert advice, which more often than not can predict problems ahead of time. Expertise from specialist organisations like the Child Poverty Action Group and Women's Budget Group, amongst others. The trade unions representing the staff who run the system and also the unique expertise held by people who have personal lived experience of the social security system and of low paid work. Um, women and children are being hit hardest and as in gender tell us, women are twice as likely to be reliant on social security as men. Now, the Scottish Government has made a good start when it comes to listening to people. The, the social security experience panels are an excellent example, as are the many ways the Social Security Scotland Act changed as a, as a result of consultation. But it's important that this continues, even when it's more difficult for the government. The Scottish Government has repeatedly refused calls to introduce a £5 top-up to child benefit, despite a huge swathe of Civic Scotland under the Give Me Five banner, saying it's a really reliable way of getting money to the poorest families right now. And I look forward to the government's forthcoming statement on the proposed income supplement, but that'll take years to come in. Top up is feasible much sooner. To close, presiding officer, too many families are living on far below what is an acceptable minimum income. And despite being assured that work is a way out of poverty, a shocking proportion of people, including 160,000 Scots children, experience poverty within working households. Despite promises to the contrary, for some people, universal credit is making this worse, not better. We need to reclaim the idea that when everyone has a decent amount, amount to live on, and crucially, that income is stable and predictable, everyone benefits. That might be through social security, through work, or a combination of both. Our social security systems, both reserved and devolved, but particularly universal credit, still have a long way to go before we can realise that vision and Greens will keep up the pressure for that. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I too start by commending the work of the committee uh, in this regard? I think it's a really important subject. Growing up and learning about economics, I always thought there was a correlation between employment rates and poverty, that we give more people more jobs, better jobs, then we can lift them out of poverty. But that is where, over the last 10 to 20 years, we've seen the spectre of in-work poverty rise. And it is insidious. It does belie the fact that employment statistics can't be a barometer for a nation's poverty or its affluence anymore. Um, I also would like to say a word in support of the work of this government here. I've said many times that I think our approach to this issue is very much in step and I thank them again for their conciliatory and consensus uh, approach to social security in this regard. So I would like to offer the support of these benches, both in terms of the committee's conclusions around the immediate end to the four-year freeze in benefits, a recasting of universal credit that is urgently required in terms of how it is administered and indeed how it is still being rolled out, and a reversal to the cuts that we have seen in uh, the, the West, by the Westminster government since 2015. My party's approach to social security has always been about poverty reduction, social mobility and making work pay. And a lot has been said about my party's role in coalition government, but there are two things I'm very proud of in our time in that government. And the first is the lifting of the income tax threshold, which at a stroke did more to address poverty, according to The Guardian, than in the previous 14 years. And also in acting as a sea anchor against the Tory cuts, which immediately became manifest when we left coalition in 2015. And this was picked up by the committee in its report, recognising what happened to in-work allowance cuts in 2015 when we left. That reality is visited in all of our surgeries, in, in casework, every single day of the week when we are back in our constituencies. It is up to us. We need a, a threefold, a, tr a triumvirate approach to addressing in-work poverty. That's about providing that adequate safety net for when people are out of work, fostering social mobility and making work pay. And the imperative has been laid out in many excellent speeches in this debate already in the 240,000 children in this country who are still in poverty. In tackling the inexorable link between 
financial worries and mental ill health. 86% of people with mental health issues cite financial concerns as a principal part of their anxiety and their distress. And indeed, suicide is three times higher in deprived communities in this country. So too, as I said, is ensuring that that safety net when people are out of work is adequate or where their need for work supplement is, is required. Um, my, and as I said at the top of my remarks, my views and those of my party are largely in step with the approach of this government in terms of where it wants to see uh, social security deployed in this country, but also how we need to redress and recast the rollout of universal credit in this country. That first took place in my constituency, as I'm sure it did in many members' constituencies in November 2018, just before Christmas. Indeed, the consequences of, in many cases, that five-week minimum wait that people had to transfer over to the universal credit bit home right around Christmas time, and that was manifest in a huge uptick uh, in the need for food banks in, our cons in my constituency and indeed in casework coming through my door and that of uh, Christine Jardin, our local MP, as well. And such was the range of legacy benefits and so rapid was that changeover that many were left confused and uh, stranded in many cases without entirely sure what their recourse was. And I think that, you know, that's reflected, I think, very well in the committee's recommendations in their conclusions, recognising that there is still no adequate online or telephone support for people struggling with the, the vagaries of the bureaucracy around the rollout of UC. The digital by default uh, phenomenon where we, we recognise that most people are being bounced into the transfer through a digital platform, whereas one third of benefit recipients are unlikely to have adequate connection to the internet, either at home or through a place accessible to them. But I think it's very important as well, and we've raised this several times, and rightly so in this chamber, the link between universal credit and domestic abuse and the unforeseen um, consequences in that. We saw that in discussions around payment to a single claimant in single claimant households in, uh, where uh, spousal abuse might be an issue. But also I think the committee raises this perfectly in its comments around transitional protections where once again abusive relationships have clearly just not been factored into the permutations and the considerations of its rollout by the Westminster government. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, so I agree and my party agrees wholeheartedly that we must end the freeze on benefits immediately. We must completely reverse the cuts to in-work benefits that were made in 2015 following our departure in coalition and we must drive up take-up of entitlements because still people are left unaware of the benefits to which they uh, are uh, allowed or entitled. We need to also dramatically change the way in which we are giving people the money. This five-week waiting time is leading to irreparable damage. It's leading to evictions. It's leading to food bank use and destitution. And if, if universal credit was originally designed to make, be, wa make work pay, to make the benefits strata more simple, then it is wholly failed in that regard. And there, are, there is an obligation on every party in this chamber and indeed this government to address that. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and it's speeches of six minutes, please. However, I do have quite a bit of time in hand, so happy to give extra time for interventions and responses. And I call Keith Brown to be followed by Jamie Halford Johnson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak today on in work poverty, an issue that's of particular importance to many of our constituents, and also on the findings of the report of the Social Security Committee, a committee of which I'm a member, uh, on the impact of universal credit on in work poverty. Uh, like many members, I've met with many constituents whose migration across to universal credit has been fraught with difficulties, resulting in significant and extreme hardships prolonged rent arrears, falling behind on bills, unable to clothe children. I've had so many constituents I held some months ago a summit on the impact of the rollout in my area uh, of universal credit. Unfortunately, neither of the two Tory MPs in my area were able to come along. But they would have heard some absolutely harrowing tales of the impact of universal credit and its rollout on real people. And this report compiles the experiences of those suffering under what is a toxic Tory policy, along with the testimonies of organisations struggling to pick up the strain to support claimants and provide it in one damning document. 
I think it's also true to say that some of the points that have been made about the impact on families and children is very true, but I understand it's even worse in England and Wales, where some of the mitigations, which I'll mention later on, are not available. It makes uh, for grim reading, presiding officer, and it's not surprising at all to me that the Tories don't want to agree with the report. Usually we can expect those on the Tory benches to stand up to make an attempt at defending universal credit and its rollout, sometimes saying, despite its many flaws. So far today, they've not even offered that caveat. Scottish Tories, it appears, are even more blindly loyal to flawed Tory policies than their counterparts south of the border. I will do. Jamie Halker johnson um, In their evidence, the IPPR noted that in-work poverty cannot be divorced from the economy. As a former economy secretary, did he take any responsibility at all for that? Indeed I did, and one of the things that she did to try and alleviate in work poverty was to support the national wage, which your party has never supported. That would have a major impact on in work poverty, not a mention of that from the Tories so far today. Uh, no one who has met and spoken with constituents nor read the report can arrive at any other conclusion than that universal credit has resulted in the rolling out of misery and undue hardship, forcing those most in need of our support into poverty. And every day the case for halting and reforming universal credit, as we just heard from Alec Douglas, Alec, to, Alec, to be uh, colloquial, and we just heard it should be halted and stopped and it should be rethought. That's been said by many people, including those organisations which are working most closely with it. And with the evidence gathered in this report, we'd be forgiven for wondering if the results that we are seeing were not the intended outcome. From what we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary, it's abundantly clear that the Scottish Government and the UK Government approaches to Social Security fundamentally differ. The Tories are the party that talk of welfare scroungers, a party that distorts terms like fairness to defend the two-child cap and the rape clause, a party that denies the existence of the bedroom tax. Nine months ago, over 7,000 claimants were promised by the Tories they would be back paid vital severe disability payments. This week, they find out they might have to wait a further six months for payments they rely on are entitled to. An absolute disgrace. Scottish Conservatives put out today a statement saying that you can't trust the SNP with a pound in your pocket. Quite rich, coming from a party that spent billions of, on overspend on aircraft carriers, on HS2, on Brexit, on Crossrail, fake ferry contracts. But the most egregious negligence was where the Tories did not spend money. Money due to many disabled, profoundly disabled people who were profoundly in need. And it's clear that you can't trust the Tories when if you're a profoundly disabled person, your pound is in the Tories' pockets. Using new social security powers, the Scottish Government is creating a system based on dignity and respect, ensuring support for those that need it most. Since last year, the Carers Allowance Supplement has given over 77,000 carers an extra 442 pounds, recognizing the incredible contributions that they make. Over 7,000 low-income households have received payments of the Best Start grant pregnancy and baby payment, ensuring that the children of Scotland have the best possible start in life. And by the end of this year, the, government will have introduced, the Scottish Government will have introduced the Best Start grant nursery age payment, £250 for families when their child starts nursery, the Best Start grant school payment, £250 for families when their child starts school. They will have introduced the funeral expense assistance, helping families with contributions towards a funeral, and the Young Carer Grant awarded to young carers 16 to 18 years old who do at least 16 hours of care a week but don't qualify for carers allowance. And once again, I'll give the opportunity to any Tory MSP that wants to stand up and say beyond 2021 they'll continue to support these benefits. And once again, not a single Tory MSP will give that commitment. And we can all read into that. The fact that what the Tories would ever do if they had the control of the levers of power, we'd prioritise tax cuts and we'd cut benefits from working people and people in poverty in order to pay for those tax cuts. Each of these benefits make a substantially positive difference to individuals and families across Scotland, treating them with compassion. And that's what a social security system looks like when it's created by a government that recognises its responsibility to tackle enduring inequalities and reducing poverty. Politics, as we all know, is a question of power and how you prioritise the use of that power. We often hear the bad joke that the Tories will win in 2021. Now, this government has made the decision to substantively change the lives of the people of Scotland for the better and has committed significant funding to tackle in-work poverty. The question for the Tories is, will they go into the election supporting the continuous continuation of these benefits? What kind of party will they be come 2021? And my guess is that it will be the same old Tories. Tax cuts for the richest, uh, wealthy uh, 
being looked after by the Conservatives and the poor being punished. Many would, uh, maybe they'd appreciate some new campaign slogans like Scottish Tories, the party of in-work poverty. But this much is clear, it's only the SNP that can be trusted on Social Security and full Social Security powers should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and the Tories um, really do not represent the best of what Scotland can achieve. And they have to change their policy, otherwise they'll continue to be met with universal and justified discredit. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Jamie Halker johnson followed by Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome this opportunity to discuss the Social Security Committee's report on in-work poverty. Last week, the ONS released figures showing that Scotland is following trends across the UK with employment at record highs and unemployment at record lows. This is undoubtedly to be welcomed, but many people in work still find themselves in low-income employment and without the opportunities and rewards that we all hope work should represent. We can, of course, look at wage growth as an important metric. Emerging from the last recession, the period of exceptional growth in employment was not matched by the similar, similar positive le levels of wage growth. This trend, however, shows signs of reversing. Across the UK, we are now seeing not only the gains in employment consolidated, but also real terms increases in wages that look to be sustainable. As the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility reported in this year's spring statement, wage growth has been revised up to 3% or higher in each year of its forecasts. However, as wages grow increasingly ahead of inflation, this chamber needs little reminding that it will be productivity growth that will make a real impact on the incomes of working people in this country and establish a strong economy. In that regard, we have, much more, work to do. We have more work to do across the UK. But the problem of productivity remains more acute in Scotland than the UK average, despite the Scottish Government's pledge to put these issues at the front and centre of its economic policy. As the committee has heard, no, no one factor can address poverty in itself. In-work poverty is he heavily concentrated in a relatively small number of sectors. Nevertheless, these sectors can be large employers. We should be looking at the particular issues that arise in these sectors and what support government can offer at this level. We should also bear in mind that measuring relative income poverty is necessarily narrow, and an analysis of one metric alone is likely to, likely to ignore particular problems in our economy. In remote and island communities, for example, higher costs of living have a considerable impact on how people's incomes can be spent. Current statistics measure income poverty before and after housing costs. This is certainly important, as increasing housing costs are a major drain on household incomes, particularly those of young people, who are less likely to own their own homes and more likely to find themselves more exposed to changes in property market through the rental sector. But this analysis ignores energy costs, transport costs, a whole suite of additional expenses that reduce disposable income for families, particularly in my region. I spoke earlier not only about employment and wages, but about opportunities in the workplace. In discussions about the levers necessary to address low pay, the Scottish Government has often brushed over the most obvious and most important area that has been within its control since the advent of devolution, education and skills. The reality is that building good quality and high paying work will take real and targeted effort to ensure that people have the skills to succeed in the labour market. And this is not only about young people entering employment for the first time, but also about providing opportunities for people established in their careers to reskill and develop in line with their aspirations. Increasingly, a skilled workforce will be essential in our rapidly changing economy. While it's tempting to see this in terms of investment in our future productivity, there's also individual angle, creating a society where people have choices and can grasp opportunities without being held back. Employability is one part of this process, and the committee has welcomed the Scottish Government's commitment to providing employment support for those moving into work. While, we've seen, while we have seen early figures from the newly devolved employability programs, there has been a troubling lack of detail which has hampered any real examination of their performance so far. The committee also noted the positive impact of Job Centre Plus work coaches in supporting those moving into work or looking to progress in their careers. There is clearly a need for services to work together in a positive way to achieve the best outcomes. Public services are at their very best when support is personalised and reflects the need of the individual. I would also like to touch briefly on personal debt which is an area that was not examined in the report despite consideration of a number of the outcomes for households with low incomes. For those on the lowest incomes, or those whose incomes are made largely by income assessed benefits, sizable debt repayments will always have the effect of pushing incomes below tolerable levels. 
We know a very large uh, proportion of people facing real financial difficulty have... Yes? Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. Um, he mentions quite rightly the problems associated with debt. Does he feel that uh, waiting five weeks for an initial payment of a benefit to which you're entitled may be a factor in pushing people into debt? Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Well, as I've mentioned and as I, as I will come to, there are a number of various uh, areas which do cause problems. And I think that's one of the things that's one that has been looked at. Uh, for, sorry, for those on the lowest incomes or those whose incomes are made large by income access benefits, sizable debt repayments will always have the effect of pushing in incomes below tolerable levels. We know a very large proportion of people facing real financial difficulty have debt problems. And we should be looking not only at tackling these issues when they become a problem, but about equipping people with the tools to manage spending. Presiding officer, it is clear, as the committee heard, that in-work poverty has a range of causes, but few simple solutions. While there are many positive signs of improvement, growing wages, the number of people at his, uh, in work at historic highs, issues remain and undoubtedly have a deep impact on people's lives. There have been several successful interventions. The increase in minimum wage levels following the announcement of the national living wage have been a major change for the lowest earners in our society. So too has taking an increasing number of those of the lowest earners out of paying tax altogether. Within this mix, I haven't got time, I'm afraid. Within this mix, this parliament has a great many lever, uh, levers that can make a positive impact on in-work poverty. But unfortunately, too often, this go Scottish government has been more inclined towards pointing the finger of blame elsewhere while ignoring areas where it clearly has failed to make progress. In many cases, such as its record in education, this government's policies have built upon problems for the future. But is it imperative on all of us to look towards building a society where work pays, where opportunities are within people's reach, and why higher pay is underpinned by a strong economy. Thank you. Claire Adamson, followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, presiding officer. And um, can I ca thank the committee for their work on this very important report. I was a former member of the Welfare Reform Committee in the last session of the Parliament and a, a former convener of the Social Security Committee and familiar with much of the work that's been done. So I'm very surprised to hear from um, particularly the Tory benches that they're waiting to see what the impacts of universal credit will be and its outcome. It has been a failing benefit since its introduction indeed. Uh, I visited the Highlands and Islands, uh, who were one of the pilot rollouts for universal credit in Scotland. And already, um, only uh, months into that pilot, they were telling us about the increase in rent arrears experienced by people and the increased need for food bank use in its area. So we know it has been failing from day one. There was also significant work done by Sheffield Hall Hallam University in uh, looking at the impact of um, welfare reform. And we know that the people who were going to be most affected by that were single parent families, young men under 25, and also disabled people. So we've known about this for a long, long time. So it's very disappointing to see people are still waiting to see what the outcomes will be. Um, yes, well, Elaine Smith. President officer, and I thank the member for taking the intervention. Um, I wonder if the member like me also received the briefing from Citizens Advice Scotland, who work day and daily with clients who are detrimentally affected by universal credit. And so perhaps she would recommend that as reading to our Conservative colleagues. Claire Adamson. I, I certainly would encourage them to read and listen to the people who are affected by these appalling legislative decisions by their government. Um, I want to talk about what, what we call social security, and I think Michelle Ballantyne mentioned it, it be, about it being a social contract. And this is a social contract between the citizens of a country and their government. And the impetus for social security systems should be to champion the vulnerable, protect those most at need. And it's intrinsic to that social, social contract. And yet what we see is the othering of disabled people, the othering of those who are in need and in zero hours contract, and the othering of those who are in receipt of disability. And the breaking of that social contract with the effect on the WASPy women, and as mentioned by Mr Brown, the effect on those who have lost out on severe disability entitlement, that, entitlement payments that they are yet to be recompensed for, despite that being promised over a year ago for those people in a botched rollout of universal credit transfer. The statistics are shameful, shameful and astonishingly, there's very little sign of this UK government listening. 
By 2021, the social security spending in Scotland is expected to be reduced by around 3.7 billion and over 3 billion stripped from those who need it most. And this is at the result of austerity from Westminster. The annual welfare reform report finds that the UK government's benefit freeze has led to a reduction of around 190 million in the current year, and this will uh, rise to 370 million by 2021. But the current UK administration seems content with their legacy. They have no understanding, they have no empathy, and little, little understanding of how precarious the financial position is for those most at need, and how easily any delay in payment and any um, delay um, or mix up due to, to um, the um, monthly payments through universal credit can force a family into financial crisis. The denial over universal credit, the figures are important and the, importantly it represents an ongoing problem and yet we see little from the UK government to see that they are addressing this gross level of inequality uh, that the rollout has caused. And if we just look at food bank use as the most striking example, <coughs> operators and volunteers of food banks are dedicated and compassionate people are doing what they can to mitigate a systemic imbalance. They should not be needed. It's a damning indictment of the current social security system that food banks exist in the first place. And the Trussell Trust has told us that in areas with full rollout of universal credit for 12 months or more, food bank use has increased by 52%. 52%, that is staggering. Thousands of Scots are driven into poverty by UK government policy. They face the ignominy of relying on charity food parcels. And then the same UK government has the temerity to pillory those people, the othering of the most vulnerable. In fact, the UK government spent over £120 million fighting appeals by claimants who were denied the benefits last year. 70% of those appeals were won by the claimants who were entitled to the support. Presiding officer, 70% failure rate of the decision-making of the DWP. In any other walk of life, that would be seen as a failed system and it should long since have been fixed by the Tory government. Last year... I hosted a reception for Menu for Change. It was written by a volunteer from a food bank in London. And it told the stories of the people who came along and attended and of one of the volunteers who themselves was in, in work poverty. And it brought home to me just how incredibly divisive the use of charity within a social security system is. It should not be needed, it should not be acceptable, and I'm very pleased that during that the panel um, praised the work of the Scottish Government in their access to the Scottish Welfare Fund in ensuring that people who are in crisis have access um, with dignity to support from this Government. So I've not got time to say much more about it, President Officer, but I think this is a hugely important report with the committee and I welcome it in the Chamber today. Elaine Smith, followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm not a member of the committee, but I want to start by thanking the committee for the work that they've done in preparing this report. And despite what the Tories claim, there's no doubt that the impact of the changes to the benefit system, and in particular the rollout of universal credit, has brought hardship to a number of households in this country. Indeed, UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights also advised that it had a bigger impact on women. As we've heard so far in the debate, in work poverty is on the increase, and that is just not acceptable. Nearly 60% of those who use food banks came from households where at least one person was in work. And the Step Change charity, uh, who recently held an information event here in Parliament, have reported that UK-wide in 2018, 55% of new clients of theirs were in employment. Their Scotland in the Red report gives us more information about what's happening, estimating that over 700,000 people in Scotland are in or at risk of problem debt. And that's problem debt that's primarily a symptom of poverty, poor housing conditions, welfare cuts, ill health and insecure work. Problem debt that simply cannot be addressed by advising that people should learn how to budget. Because no matter how skillful you might be, it's not possible to create a budget out of nothing. And that is often what is left to people at the end of the week. As the Child Poverty Action Group points out in a very helpful briefing for this debate, in the past three years, 65% of children living in poverty are within households with at least 
one adult in work, a point made by Mark Griffin in his opening um, contribution as well. And that is from the Scottish Government's own analysis of poverty and income inequality, and it really is shameful. So whilst Tory austerity um, is certainly to blame for much of the poverty in this country, if we are to be serious about developing policies and interventions which reverse this trend, then this Parliament must also take some responsibility. It really isn't good enough to pass all of the responsibility to the UK Parliament, nor to place the blame solely on the aspects of the social security system reserved to Westminster. Now, the committee report does draw attention to a number of steps that the Scottish Government could be taking to improve people's lives here and now. And I want to focus uh, on that. As I raised in the chamber before the Easter recess, and indeed as raised by Alison Johnson in her contribution, the refusal to consider an immediate uplift in child benefit, whilst more and more families struggle to put food on the table, seems to me to be indefensible. And we still don't seem to have clear progress on the proposed income supplement, other than a letter through the committee assuring us that a report will come in June. So perhaps I could ask the Minister in responding to the debate to let us know how will the income supplement actually take account of the reality of the flexible labour market of today? I think we, we need to get answers to some of these questions. Payment of the living wage, presiding officer, is not a requirement for many public sector contracts, and it should be. The government's national standard on funded early learning and childcare providers requires that the staff delivering the childcare should receive the living wage. However, as highlighted by a Scottish Parliament research paper just this month and by Audit Scotland, this applies only to the actual hours that staff member works on ELC funded places. So there could be two rates of pay for different times of the day for the same staff member. And furthermore, the requirement does not apply to all staff in the nursery or daycare facility. Again, there's nothing in a publicly funded contract which provides for a living wage as a minimum for the cleaning staff, for the janitors or the other support workers. And that's only one example. There are many more and we can do something in Scotland today about wage levels and about contracts. Decent, well-paid and secure employment is what is needed to ensure that standards of living rise and in-work poverty falls. And I think that employment statistics deserve far closer examination for us to fully understand the reality of what is happening in people's lives. If I could just turn to the Scottish Welfare Fund, it was mentioned by Claire Adamson in uh, the, the contribution previous to my own, and that's another resource over which the Scottish Government does have control. Community care grants and crisis grants are, of course, administered at a local authority level. But in some areas, these are difficult to apply for due to lengthy and very intrusive forms and questions. So that's something that I would ask the government to look at. The committee asks that the grants be increased, and certainly I support that call. But we also must ask what is being done to ensure there's no underspend in the fund and that the payments reach all of those who need them. Because last year, there was an underspend of 2.3 million in Scotland in the Scottish Welfare Fund. And we know that during that time, food bank use continued to rise. So eligibility criteria, uh, sorry, eligibility criteria for it includes low income households, uh, whether or not receiving benefits and with or without children. In fact, 54% of the households assisted by the Scottish Welfare Fund over the last five years were single person households. And I think that that may indicate a level of need that requires specific policy intervention, something again, that the government might want to pick up from this debate. The most common uh, Scottish Welfare Fund crisis grant expenditure as reported up to September 2018 was for food, essential heating expenses and other living expenses. There are crisis grants, of course, which will include recipients who are in work. And food, for which we should all have a basic right, the right to food accounts for 60% of crisis grant expenditure. So that's for people who are actually in work as well. Basically, what we are is a society that is failing to feed everyone, and that has got to change. So, in closing, can I commend the recommendations in the report um, to the Chamber, and again, thank the committee, everyone who gave evidence, and the clerks for the report, but also urge the government and Parliament itself to do far more with the powers at our disposal, to change direction and to reverse the growing gap between rich and poor in our society. We really can't afford to not address child poverty right now in our society. Thank you. Tom Arthur, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, President Officer. I'm 
grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this debate and I would like to begin by commending the Social Security Committee on what I thought was a very worthwhile, considered and timely report. And I think that has been reflected in the contributions we've had from across the Chamber this afternoon. One theme that has run amongst many speeches, at least I think on these benches, is the relation between what we are discussing in the abstract to the lived experience of our constituents. Often in debating matters such as Social Security, given the complexity of policy and the huge sums of money involved, it can be rather easy, as I see, to say to slip into the abstract. I think it's one of the most effective elements of this committee report is to be found in page 14, where it gives first-hand first -hand accounts of those lived experiences. If I may just share with the Chamber, case one on page 14, a woman living with her partner and young child. Since moving to universal credit, she owes more than £7,000 on her credit card. Case two, a single parent sanctioned for volunteering in a community project instead of spending that time looking for paid work. Case three, children caught stealing food from a community garden. Their mother had no money for food as her UC claim had been delayed for a week. This is 21st century Scotland we are living in and that is what is happening around us. Not because of the policy actions of this government, which this parliament is elected to hold to account, but because of the policy actions of the UK government at Westminster, which has been successively rejected in Scotland at previous elections. <coughs> now, it does raise a question about what is the role of this parliament, and I know there's a debate regarding what our responsibilities are in responding but I think it's, it's worth noting and reiterating the point that the Cabinet Secretary made. We are spending now over £120 million every year mitigating welfare cuts from the UK Government. £120 million is what we spend on the Pupil Equity Fund, something that I know is having a transformative impact for young people and particularly young people from rather challenged backgrounds in my own constituency. Think what we could do with that additional £120 million if we did not have to spend that mitigating cuts that we did not make and for which we do not receive the savings. Now, the debate about poverty, the debate about in-work poverty is, of course, as many members have alluded to, incredibly complex. Social security is but one aspect of that. And I think, as I've said, the work of this report highlights where the challenges are within reserve benefits. The contribution from the Cabinet Secretary and some of my colleagues highlights the work that the Scottish Government is doing to mitigate this. But there is broader work that has been undertaken, of course, which is the Scottish Government's commitment to fair work. And that is important. Also important is the Scottish Government's commitment on public sector pay, because we do, of course, understand that there is a relationship between public sector pay and private sector pay. Sal salaries can become more competitive when we increase public sector pay. But again, these are tangential. They are attempts to mitigate. We are not dealing with the problem at source. And where I have a, a grave concern is that when I think about where we will be in two years' time, four years' time, ten years' time, with the challenges that are coming down the track in the labour market, if we are not able to address these issues at source, then we are not going to be able to mitigate the catastrophic damage that will be inflicted upon the livelihoods of our constituents, upon our communities, communities which are being disadvantaged because some people are being sanctioned for seeking to go and do community work, as this report highlights. So what is the solution? Well, I, I think the solution ultimately is to be for this parliament to be responsible for all powers over social security, rather than this piecemeal approach. And I do understand the arguments for pragmatism, for focusing on the powers that we have, but we are limited in what we can do. And as, as already been highlighted, 230,000 children 
in poverty. One in four, one in ten children in persistent poverty. And that is important because with the cuts that have been made, cumulatively it will be £3.7 billion. That is not a saving for the UK government. It is, saving, it is just storing up problems for the future because every single one of these children is more at risk of being affected by adverse childhood experiences of a challenged upbringing which will result in reduced opportunities and, redu and limited potential which in the future could make them consequently more require uh, more needing of support from the state so the policies that the UK government are pursuing they are not policies which have the long-term well-being of our constituents at heart they're not policies which are going to build up our communities strengthen our people genuinely help people get into work rather they are just an expression couched in the language of work pays of very old and sadly indelible Tory values, which is the deserving and the undeserving. And I don't want that for my constituents. I don't want it for my country. And that's why this parliament needs full powers over social security. Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Alistair Allen. Deputy Presiding Officer, let me begin by thanking everyone for their work on this important report. We debate the issue of in-work poverty at the same time as in Scotland and indeed across the UK we see strong record-breaking employment levels. In January we learnt that the UK employment rate rose to over 75%, the highest since comparable estimates began, while for the first time in decades in Scotland we have record low unemployment. It has been referred to as the jobs miracle and is evidence of the attractiveness that the UK market continues to hold for business. The creation of jobs and ensuring people are in employment is the basis of ensuring that work pays. And other policies and principles adopted by the UK Conservative government are equally important to this. Policies such as the commitment to increase the personal allowance to 12 and a half thousand pounds a year earlier than expected. This builds on progress already made, where 1.74 million of the lowest paid workers have been taken out of paying income tax altogether. The introduction of the national living wage, which having continually increased over the years, had helped some 300,000 workers out of low pay by 2017. These are policies that should be welcomed across the chamber they provide longer-term solutions that allow people to keep more of their own hard-earned money while developing skills and experience that can lead to happier and more fulfilling lives. But when people are in work and still experiencing poverty, we must recognize that that as a problem must be tackled. Human lives in which money can play such an important part are naturally complicated and we should be careful about blaming any single set of circumstances or government policy for in-work poverty. Relative income greatly depends on a list of different factors, including education, performance of the economy, and high living costs such as housing and utilities. Powers to tackle these issues fall within both reserved and devolved responsibilities and require action from both the UK and Scottish governments. Universal credit is, of course, one policy that has been scrutinized in detail throughout the report. Its policy intentions, namely of simplifying the welfare system and being designed around trying to help recipients budget in the same way they would a monthly salary, should be welcomed. Nevertheless, the UK government is taking time to correct things and to try and get it right, and has made a number of improvements, including raising work allowances by £1,000 per year, and also the offer of the more generous taper rate. Improving the welfare system in these ways ensures that it fulfills the role that it is designed to do, which is to support progression into work. The sort of scrutiny carried out into Social Security by the committee, including in this report on in-work poverty, is needed at a critical time for welfare reform to ensure that we get it right, both at Westminster and in Scotland, as we take on greater powers here. But in understanding in-work poverty itself, we cannot simply pay lip service to certain factors. In tackling the problem, we need to adopt a holistic approach. 
Responding to in-work poverty also requires us to think about why less money is coming into households and more is going out and how this can change. In the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee in this session of Parliament, we have looked at the performance of the Scottish economy, where levels of GDP growth are marginal, productivity is low and wages are stagnant. Our productivity performance has been stagnating for a number of years. We're 20% below our target levels of productivity. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, in a report into in-work poverty, says that the key to sustaining higher hourly wages is higher productivity, which could improve the problem of in-work poverty enormously. So there's much work to do in Scotland if we are to reach the levels of productivity amongst other OECD countries, which bring in higher wages. And the levels of expenditure that households are now having to put up with continues to increase. Yes, certainly. Tom Arthur. I'm very grateful uh, for the member for giving way. I, I listened to his uh, remarks with interest. Would you also recognise that there's an argument that increased wages can drive up productivity by necessitating firms to invest to in adaptations and developments and new technologies that will buy dint of that increased productivity? Gordon Lindhurst. Well, I would thank Tom Arthur for that intervention. Of course, all of these things are interlinked. And uh, it's not a simple matter of one leading to the other, but there is a complex interplay of these factors, um, which I think we all recognize. And I want to turn to look at the levels of expenditure that households are now having to put up with. And this continues to increase, with local authorities struggling to make ends meet through the ring fencing of much of their budgets. This SNP government has increased the council tax limit. But families are already struggling to pay with council tax costs being a major factor for nearly 700,000 people in Scotland who have debt problems. In-work poverty is, of course, a matter that is deeply regrettable, but there are numerous reasons for this. So while this report has considered the role of social security in that, we cannot not ignore the pressures that are put on families who see a dwindling income relative to outgoings, which increase all the time. In concluding, if we are to truly tackle the complex problem of in-work poverty, we need an all-encompassing approach that pursues policies that tackle that pressure and to show that work really does pay. Alistair Allen, followed by Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, like other members of the committee, can I uh, thank uh, the clerks and all who gave evidence to the inquiry. The overwhelming evidence that we received on the Social Security Committee was firstly that poverty is a clear reality for many Scots who are in work and secondly that the UK government's shambolic rollout of universal credit has actively contributed towards worsening that in work poverty. Now there were, I acknowledge, two Conservative members of the committee who largely dissented from that assessment but I believe that the evidence presented to us uh, speaks for itself and allowed the committee to come to a very clear view. Now, as Bob Doris mentioned, it is disappointing that neither the UK's Secretary of State for Work and Pensions nor their Minister for Employment were able to accept uh, the committee's invitation to give evidence to our inquiry, despite universal credit and much else in the benefits system still being matters largely reserved to Westminster. In any case, I want to focus briefly on a couple of related areas of the committee's findings, namely around the weight which individuals are experiencing uh, to receive their initial universal credit payment, and also the fact that assessment dates do not always align uh, with people's actual pay days. Now, both of those things uh, have a real human cost, as the committee heard from many witnesses. We are in agreement with the UK government about the importance of encouraging a culture where people manage their incomes responsibly. However, as Russell Goonson of IPPR Scotland pointed out to the committee, it is not good enough to tell people on the lowest fluctuating incomes. Potentially, they are people in insecure work, whether self-employed or otherwise, that they just need to budget better. In particular, budgeting, presiding officer, is easier said than done if your job pays every four weeks, but universal credit is assessed once a calendar month. The very significant peaks and troughs which this can create in family incomes, particularly when a, a, pe a person finds that they have essentially been penalised for receiving two wages in one calendar month, are by no means easy to manage. 
The UK government has acknowledged the problem, but they have given very little indication of whether they are going to do anything about it, uh, as Alison Johnson pointed out. Now, as a committee, we therefore strongly recommended that the UK government at least maintain the flexibility allowed by the current rate of the higher earnings threshold before income is carried over, uh, and any attempt to reduce this will have major consequences for many people in work who are trying to manage their incomes at something like a steady level. The committee also uh, concluded that it is unacceptable for anyone to have to wait five weeks for benefits to which they are entitled. And yet that is exactly what happens to people awaiting their first universal credit payment, uh, as Mark Griffin and others pointed out. Now, I cannot be the only person, I know I am not the only person in this chamber who has had to deal with constituents who have had to live off a combination of charity, debt and fresh air during that five-week period. There is also evidence in some cases of administrative delays which have prolonged this waiting period further or have resulted in elements being missed from clients' universal credit payments. And the committee concluded that it is unacceptable to make anyone wait this length of time and recommends that the UK government urgently redesigns this system to ensure that payments are made within two weeks. Because there are, as I said, presiding officer, uh, human consequences uh, to policy failures of this kind. And one of these, the committee was left in very little doubt, uh, is hunger. Nonetheless, presiding officer, the Conservative Social Security spokesperson, Michelle Ballantyne, speaking about food poverty on the 12th of February, said, what we haven't got is hard evidence about what the real causes are. I haven't yet seen the concrete evidence of where that's coming from, meaning food poverty. Well, I'm afraid that, like the Trussell Trust, the Church of Scotland, and the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, the committee felt little of Ms. Ballantyne's sense of mystery uh, about at least one of the reasons why food poverty might exist in the UK. Indeed, only the day before Ms. Ballantyne's remarks, Work and Pension Secretary Amber Rudd MP herself admitted it is absolutely clear that there were challenges with the initial rollout of universal credit. The main issue which led to an increase in food bank use could have been the fact that people had difficulty accessing their money early enough. Uh, well, I think uh, the committee was left uh, in, in no doubt uh, that uh, food poverty uh, and the failures uh, of the way universal benefit has been rolled out are very closely connected. Presenting officer, um, we hear a lot from the Conservatives about any measure which they think might infringe on the rights of hard-working families. Well, let me remind them that people on the upper rates of income tax, such as politicians, hard-working, though I do not doubt we all are, do not have a monopoly on hard work. As we've heard from the committee convener, 18% of hard-working people in Scotland are in fact paid less than the real living wage. And as this committee report finds, the way in which universal credit has been implemented by the UK government makes those families' lives even more difficult. Thank you very much. Uh, I call Alec Rowley to be followed by George Adam. Mr Rowley, please. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Like many other speakers, I welcome this report and congratulate the committee on its publication. I note that the report has very clear and well-argued recommendations, and I hope this Parliament will get behind those recommendations and fight for the change that we need, particularly in welfare. The report is clear that the benefits freeze has disproportionately impacted on the poorest, that universal credit is not working for many claimants, that the digital first requirement gives cause for concern, that the committee was surprised and disappointed about managed migration for which there has been little or no planning, that the transitional protection under managed migration can be lost should they be a victim of domestic abuse and that universal credit does not provide an exception in these circumstances to protect someone from the losses that they would incur and that it is counterproductive to close job centres at a time when demand for their services is scheduled to increase. Ahead of the autumn budget, UK Labour launched 10 emergency demands for the budget to help repair the damage caused by the rollout of universal credit. 
These demands included cut the five-week wait, remove the insistence on making and managing a claim online, end counterproductive sanctions, allow split payments, as, as, as is the case in Scotland, allow direct landlord payments that has been introduced in Scotland, reverse cuts to disabled people, reverse cuts to children, reinstate the family element and get rid of the two-child limit, support people on the fluctuation of income, restore work allowances and end the freeze on social security. These are all areas that, if they were to be carried out, they would certainly have a, a, a positive impact on the rollout of universal credit. And specifically in Scotland, we have said that we would reduce in-work poverty by topping up child benefit by £5 a week, tackling the cost of living crisis by fixing our broken energy market, capping private sector rent increases and making public transport more affordable. We, do, we would introduce a £10 an hour living wage, establish sectorial collective bargaining along with sectorial industrial and economic planning as part of a long overdue industrial strategy for Scotland. We would make the real living wage and labour standards, including trade union rights, a condition of public procurement. All of these measures would help in addressing the unacceptable levels of poverty in our country. And as the Resolution Foundation recently warned, things are not going in the right direction. They said that 23% of Scottish children, around 230,000 children living in Scotland, lived in households that were below the UK relative poverty line in 2016-17. The Child Poverty Scotland Act requires that the Scottish Government will reduce this to below 18% by 23-24 and below 10% by 2030-31. But the Resolution Foundation state that their, proje their projection combine an economic forecast with planned tax and benefit policies suggests that the Scottish child poverty rate is in fact likely to be higher in 23-24 than it was in 2016-17. The projected rate of 29% would be the highest in over 20 years. Although uncertain such as the outcome would leave over 100,000 children more living in poverty than if the interim target was met. So this demonstrates that we need action. They say UK-wide benefits policy is the key cause of this, with the benefit freeze, the two-child limit and other welfare cuts taking substantial amounts of money from lower-income parents. But they go on to say but the Scottish Government also has the power to reduce child poverty and much will depend on the generosity, design and funding of the promised income, income supplement. John Dickey, Director of the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, said that families are struggling right now and that families could not wait years for the introduction of the Scottish Government's promised income supplement and he believes that a £5 top-up to child benefit would be one simple way of lifting thousands of children out of poverty. Mr Dickey said, and I quote, these aren't just statistics, these are children going hungry, missing out on school trips, unable to enjoy the activities and opportunities their better off peers take for granted. These are parents going without meals, juggling debt and seeing their own health suffer to protect their children from the poverty that they face. He said, poverty has a firm grip on Scotland. Behind these statistics, there is the reality that over one million people are locked in a daily struggle to make end meet. Douglas Hamilton of the Poverty and Inequality Commission said that the time is now for meaningful action. And I quote, if the Scottish Government is serious about addressing this, it should be making full use of their powers to reduce housing costs, improve earnings and enhance social security. 
Shelter Scotland has also welcomed the fact that this report recognises that in-work poverty is driven by many factors, including the cost of housing. So much to be done, as this report points out. I would conclude by saying we must move beyond talking about addressing poverty. We need action, and we need action now. Thank you very much. I call George Adam to follow by Alexander Stewart. Mr Adam, please. Thank you, President Officer. I was a member of this committee when we took most of the evidence for uh, this uh, investigation into in-work poverty. And uh, I think I left just towards uh, when we started to do the report. And one of the things that I've, I've listened to this debate and I listened to all the information that I received during that period. But one of the things that I keep finding quite strange is some of the things that we're hearing from the Conservative Party. Because Jamie Halcrow Smith says helping people to manage uh, their money. Now, that's all well and good. And that is highly commendable. That's if they've got any money to manage. Because the problem is that after five weeks and ending up in arrears and your rent, you're in crisis situation at that point, And you're beyond just getting a wee help in hand and telling you how to deal with your finances. So I find that quite, I find that the tone from the Tories in this debate uh, quite disgusting, actually. And uh, I was also disappointed to hear during the convener's uh, information, that uh, convener's speech, Bob Doris, that the committee didn't manage to secure a meeting from my UK minister because we've constantly been told there has been a respect agenda between both parliaments and we should all work together in order to make sure we can make things better. Yes, I will do. Thank you, Bob George Doris. Adam. Thank you, George Adam, for giving it. I think put on the record at this point, uh, President Officer, the reason uh, Alec Sharma, MP, the most recent refusal to attend the committee was due to uh, Brexit was the reason cited. So I think... A sorry, I can't hear you. are turning away from the microphone. Could you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, Presiding Officer. I just want to make the point that the, the latest reason a UK minister could not attend uh, the Social Security Committee was that Brexit was cited as the reasons. Thank you very much, George Well, Adam. that's all well and good, but at the end of the day, if we can't have a minister of uh, the UK government to scrutinise the policies that they are using to de destroy communities and attack uh, families in our uh, basic constituencies, then there is something far wrong with that. But we've also heard, and as I keep saying, presiding officer, I've been listening carefully to what everyone said, and we've heard from Michelle Ballantyne that universal credit is a test and learn policy. A test and learn policy, presiding officer. Well, that depends what the test is, doesn't it? If the test is, do you live in abject poverty? Uh, then it would probably be that they're actually succeeding because they're making sure that members of our communities are living in poverty. And if the learning from it is learning that you can never trust the Conservatives with any form of policy to do with uh, people in our community, then that's all we seem to be learning from it. There is no test and learn. All we're learning is that the same old callous Tories are continuing with their devastation in our communities. And we've heard from countless Tories that this, one of the things I think I heard from someone was this debate is bogged down in political posturing. Well, excuse me, presiding officer, if I'm standing up for people in my constituency who are struggling through this Tory-designed financial mire, and that's exactly what it is. It's a Tory-designed financial mire. Most of the Tory involvement in this debate has been pure fantasy. During Michelle Ballantyne's contribution, uh, I half expected the late, great Ricardo Montalban to don his famous white suit, go down to the front and say, welcome to Fantasy Island. But the only difference between that great 1970s show and the Conservatives is that finished every week with a happy ending. There ain't no happy ending with the Conservative Party in Scotland. And that's when it brings us back to when you look at some of the things that were actually said during the report itself. Like the Social Security Committee made clear the Scottish Government could not be expected to mitigate on impact of every UK policy, welfare policy. Now, that's one of the things that we constantly hear from the Conservatives in particular. And the view was of the committee, it is the view of the committee that the UK government's freeze on benefits must be lifted. It's not realistic to expect the Scottish government to top up or mitigate every UK welfare policy to ensure that the income of Scottish claimants does not drop in real terms. And that's true. Because constantly we cannot be the ones that in our limited uh, budget that we have in this Scottish Parliament, that we are the ones that try and save uh, the, the people of Scotland from these constant attacks from the Westminster government. 
And the UN Special Rapporteur said the same. Professor Philip Alton also said it was not sustainable to do so. In his statement, he said, devolved administrations have tried to mitigate the worst impacts of austerity, despite experiencing significant reductions in block grant funding and constitutional limits on their ability to raise revenue. But mitigation comes at a price, and it is not sustainable. And that's part of the problem. The Tories can say what they like in this chamber, but everything that they're putting forward is not sustainable. They know. They know that the universal credit by its very inception is a callous policy that is causing poverty throughout our communities. And Michelle Ballantyne, if she wants to say something, she can if she wishes, instead of shouting from the sidelines, because this is more important than that, presiding officer. We can't have people shouting from the sidelines when my constituents are suffering. And I wonder what she's got to say about that. Uh, Ms Ballantyne. Well, as George Adam is keen to have an invention, intervention, perhaps say he could answer the question, does he recognise that 80% of people on universal credit are satisfied with it and are happy with the treatment they've had on it? George Adam. I can only answer that and the fact that my constituents who I serve diligently and hear the horror stories that come from her policies, sorry, presiding officer, the Conservative Party's policies, as they continue attack Absolutely. our communities. Yeah. And I, for one, will no longer listen to that nonsense because I am sick of the posturing coming from the Conservative Party. This is about my constituencies, constituents and the people I represent and the people of Scotland. And once the Tories need to be called out continually for the chaos they are causing in our communities. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Emma Harper. Uh, I have to say, Mr Stewart is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. So other speakers not here have been warned. Mr Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to take part in this afternoon's debate on Social Security Committee's report on Social Security and in-work poverty. I am not a member of the committee, but I do commend the work that the committee have put forward and the report that they produced. Whilst we have made significant progress on employment in recent years, with now fewer than 100,000 people in Scotland unemployed for the first time in decades, we are all here today to understand that work in work poverty is a real concern for many individuals and many families across Scotland. And it is one that needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency. One of the major problems we have with this is that de de this debate can be framed in the wrong way, with a narrow focus on incomes and welfare, in particular with the real problems of in-work poverty, go much, much further and much, much deeper. The problem has to be that there are various drivers, from education to housing, from childcare to transport, that may all play a part uh, in, in this whole system of in-work poverty. I am glad to see the committee has listened to the organisation uh, like the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, which recognised the important pact within the report, that childcare costs, for example, are a significant problem for those on low income. As this report outlines, when parents are weighing up the benefits of work versus the cost of getting childcare and getting themselves into a job, it can be a real situation for them. And another problem that is abundantly clear is the cost of housing, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Jesus Wrong to Youth Foundation also estimated that, that a number of households with children receiving benefit has doubled since the mid-1990s and the rate of relative poverty increases when household costs are taken into account. And we must not forget, however, these are many of the drivers in in-work poverty are in fact devolved to this parliament and the Scottish Government have an opportunity to do and react. Rather than tackle the problem head on, uh, we have seen that a, a, a manifesto commitment was, was broken earlier uh, in uh, uh, this, this chamber when the council tax, uh, or the freeze that we had for local government was removed. Now, we are well aware uh, that the general, lo uh, the general uh, local government funding down uh, and with a 3% cap removed from local authorities has raised uh, council tax by four or even more than that. This has a continual impact uh, on individuals and we learned from uh, Step Change Scotland, uh, the charity who warned that hundreds of thousands of people have a problem with debt as a result of council tax arrears. Unless it is... Yes? Alec Rowley. You're saying I'm grateful for the intervention. Would you accept, however, that welfare reforms have had the greatest impact in the cause of increasing poverty in Scotland? 
Alexander. Thank you for that intervention. Uh, welfare reforms have evolved and continue to evolve. Uh, and as I've said, we are now finding that employment uh, is up, unemployment is down. We want to ensure that people get the opportunity so that when people do require benefit, they get the best of it. And we know uh, that there have been some issues with uh, universal credit, but we're tackling that uh, to ensure that the people receive the most uh, who require support get that support. Unless it is urgently addressed, the Scottish Government's mismanagement of local government will only worsen the problem of in-work poverty. Whilst not the sole cause of in-work poverty, Welfare, welfare is nevertheless a factor that needs to be considered. We need a welfare system that supports people into the workplace and helps those who are struggling, while at the same time it's fair for the taxpayer. And we, we look at what Labour had in the past. The welfare system that came before uh, was complicated, was complex, and sometimes resulted in the ludicrous situation where people who were left uh, who, who wanted to earn more uh, and had the opportunity to get a job were actually worse off. Universal Credit seeks to change that. The principle is a simple one. Work should always pay. While it is central to the principle that we in the Scottish Conservatives believe, I hope that others also believe that. We do nevertheless recognise that there have been some flaws in the implementation. And the recently appointed Secretary of State, Amber Rudd, has herself acknowledged that there has been and there continues to be issues that require to be addressed. And these have been and are being addressed. Uh, she has already halted the rollout of three million cases uh, of the legacy, extended families for the two kind of benefit, and also ensured that payments go directly to the women in many cases in the household. In addition, the Fund for Advanced Payments has been set up to plug the gap between applying for universal credit and receiving the first payment. And we've heard today from many members about that difficulty. So that difficulty has been acknowledged and that difficulty is trying to be addressed. There are well, generally the UK is committed to making work pay and supporting the lowest paid within our societies. And under a strong economy and uh, where wages are grow and the employment is going up, that is what we want to see. Meanwhile, the UK government has also supported hundreds of thousands in the lowest paid people in in ensuring that the national living wage it now sits at 8.21 per hour in comparison with the national minimum wage, which was 6.70. And in addition, local government uh, and the UK government has continued to increase the level of tax-free personal allowance, cutting for millions of people. Since 2010-11, this reform has taken 1.74 million of the lowest paid in the UK out of paying income tax entirely. That has to be a good thing for these families. That has to offer them the opportunity to develop and expand uh, their potential. They are important important changes that we should be go forward. But despite all of that, the universal credit uh, has been looked upon as a wider uh, and, and the, the, the government itself have, have, have made some criticisms after criticism of the welfare reforms. And we've heard these today in this chamber, but we must also look back at the move and consider what, what these criticisms are saying. Let us not forget the Scottish Government have the power to reverse or adapt any of these policies, but have chosen not to. They have failed to deliver on their own manifesto when it comes to welfare and have said that delay after delay, even for the 11 benefits that are coming to Scotland. And I find it rather ironic that a party who have claimed that Scotland could become an independent country within 18 months have talked about it taking nine years uh, to ensure that we can manage uh, some of the uh, devolved responsibilities coming forward. So in conclusion, Deputy Brian Robert, this this is still work in progress. Much has been achieved. The UK government is committed to working, ensuring that work pays and to take part. The Scottish government have to resolve uh, and, and work holistically to ensure that this government needs to put its existing developed powers at a better use to help us support individuals and families to overcome the problems of in-work poverty by tackling the cost of living. Thank you. Well, yes, you did take a little longer than I should have allowed you, but I'm in a good mood. Uh, uh, I call Emma Harper and then we move to closing speeches. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. I hope you're in a good mood for me as well this afternoon. I am pleased to speak into today's debate and I'd like to thank committee members, clerks and those who gave evidence for this report to be created. I'm not a member of the Social Security Committee, but the issue of welfare is one which is important to many of my South Scotland constituents, including those in the South West of Scotland. And from the outset in my contribution today, I would like to put on record that it is this SNP government that will continue to challenge the UK government's punitive, unfair and unjust welfare reforms that take money out of the pockets of the most vulnerable people in our society and those who are just barely managing to get by. 
I completely agree with Claire Adams' in sentiment that Social Security is about support, support for people during the times when they need it most. Stigma is something that absolutely needs to be addressed when we are trying to support the people who are the most vulnerable in our society. President Officer, the remit of the Social Security Committee's inquiry was to explore the potential impact of universal credit on in-work poverty. And we've heard specific casework examples today across Chamber. And the committee included consideration of recent research on trends in low wages and in-work poverty, as well as indications of increasing financial need in working households, including, for example, increased use of food banks. And that's something that we've seen a marked increase in the rise in Dumfries and Galloway in my South Scotland region. The Trussell Trust released figures last year revealing the use of food banks in Dumfries and Galloway. It rose between April and September by 44% last year. And that was over the same period the year before. This is the second highest rise of food banks across Scotland in all of the 32 local authorities. And Mark Franklin at First Base Food Bank in Dumfries says that his figures are similar to the Trussell Trust ones. So I would like to touch on some of the key findings from the committee's report. And I think that uh, the most important is some of these issues that are worth reaffirming. The work uh, allowance levels were reduced substantially and almost abolished in April 2016. And before 2016, every claimant had a work allowance, but since then, only those with a disability or a child get a work allowance, and the rate is based on whether someone's universal credit includes amounts for housing costs or not. The committee welcomed the increases to the work allowance in universal credit, but noted that the full work allowances should be restored to pre-2016 levels. This is an extremely important point as it encourages people in the workplace by allowing families as well as single people who are just getting by some additional money every month to help with household costs. Another universal credit design issue is that of the, universal, uh, the UK government's policy intention to extend in-work conditionality, and Bob Dodd has talked about this in his opening remarks. Unlike working tax credits, in universal credit there is no requirement to work 16 hours before being entitled to claim. And although it is not being actively applied unless someone is on very low wages, the policy intention is that someone in receipt of universal credit could be subject to conditionality and even sanctions despite working more than 16 hours a week, as reaffirmed in paragraph 112 of the Social Security Committee's report. This presiding officer means that families across my South Scotland region who are just managing to get by with support from universal credit, which is £338 a month for single people and £541 for couples under the administrative earnings threshold. They could lose out of these vital funds should they not earn more money than was the case when they started their UC claim. The committee was also concerned about the plans for managed migration, particularly as many people in the receipt of working tax credits may not consider themselves benefits recipients. And the committee considered that the existing concerns with universal credit should be addressed before moving to manage migration. All these issues are a direct result of an out-of-touch UK government determined to press on with welfare reforms which are affecting people across the whole of Scotland. I would ask the Scottish Government to continue to do all it can to press for Scotland to lead the way and to have control over all welfare powers as soon as practicable. Thousands of individuals and families across Scotland are being forced into poverty because of devastating UK government welfare cuts. But of these cuts, Social Security spending in Scotland is ex expected to have reduced by £3.7 billion since 2010. The annual welfare reform report found that UK government's benefit freeze has led to huge reductions in spending, around £190 million of the current year 2018-19, rising to about £370 million by 2020 and 2021. This is equivalent to three times the annual police budget. It's staggering. The report also found that universal credit claimants are over six times as likely to be sanctioned as claimants of other legacy benefits. And young men are the ones most likely to be sanctioned. Local authorities and third sector agencies are being left to pick up the pieces of a broken system, investing their own money to support people on universal credit. 
And in my remaining time, I'd like to put on record my thanks to a number of third sector and charity agencies across Dumfries and Galloway working to mitigate the impact of Tory welfare cuts, including First Base Agency and Mark Franklin in Dumfries, who came to the committee to provide evidence. And in conclusion, I add my support to the Social Security Committee's report and call on the UK Government to halt the rollout of this flawed system. Take seriously the concerns from across the third sector, even from international organisations such as the UN. I welcome this report and commend the report today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I move to closing speeches, there's one member who spoke in the debate who's not present. I expect the SNP Whips to tell that member. I expect a note of apology and explanation. Um, and I move on to closing speeches. A little time in hand. So, Ms Grant, I give you seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, like others, welcome the committee report. We have all known a long, for a long time about the big issues within work, poverty and universal credit, but to have these issues laid bare by the committee makes stark reading. To know that 60% of working age adults in Scotland are in relative poverty and they were in working households is absolutely stark. The Fraser of Allender economic commentary said, despite record levels of employment, for many being in work is no longer providing the security and prosperity it once did. This is absolutely unacceptable. A lot of the committee report focuses on universal credit, which takes over from working tax credits. And Emma Harper made the point um, in her speech just, just now that getting a tax credit for many did not feel like they were getting a benefit. And changing to universal credit changes the ethos behind that. The committee highlighted concerns and that we all hear about uh, from constituents about universal credit. Concerns about the length of time people wait for payments, that is absolutely unacceptable. Most people claiming universal credit don't have savings that will last them five weeks. Concerns about what payments take into account as earnings. And Mark Griffin, in his speech, laid bare the worst excesses of the scheme. He told us that someone's tax rebate was being treated as income and their universal credit was being reduced. Alex Rowley talked to, said that the benefit freeze had actually made universal credits unacceptable as well. Michelle B Ballantyne, in response to some of those criticisms, said that the UK government have a test and learn approach. And this is callous. When people are living in poverty, living out of food banks, people are not guinea pigs for Tory policy. Surely they have learned that this is unacceptable. Claire Adamson told us where universal credit has been rolled out, food banks have, a, the use of food banks has increased by 52%. This is a test and it clearly shows failure. Will the UK government learn from it? And just as worrying, Elaine Smith talked about well, the welfare fund being underspent in areas where food bank use was still increasing, again unacceptable. The Tories implemented the terrible policy of a two-child cap, but the SNP will do nothing to mitigate it. I fought for a Scottish Parliament to defend us from the worst excesses of a Tory government. And yet this SNP government does not use the powers that they have to do this. I will join them in criticising the UK government, but I cannot stand by quietly and while they refuse to act. Many speakers talked about the digital first policy um, with, with universal credit, and that is a huge problem in the Highlands and Islands and area I represent. There is a lack of connectivity, both digitally and no public transport to allow people to travel to where they could fill in a digital claim. Therefore, it makes it almost impossible to apply. And Bob Doris and others talked about the closure of job centres, making it much more difficult for people to apply digitally because they then have to travel, but also cutting down engagement with advisors. Elaine Smith spoke about, and so did Alec Riley speak about, um, the late Scottish Labour Party policy of a child benefit of the top up of five pounds a week to lift children out of poverty. And again, the SNP have refused to implement this, eh, despite presiding over an increase in child poverty. 
Alison Johnston pointed out that organisations working with children have said that this is an easy way of tackling child poverty. Not the only thing we can do, but a quick fix that we, until we can find better, better re, um, solutions. Even if the Scottish Government believe that this is not the way forward, surely it could be implemented quickly while they work on their alternative. Again, use the powers they have to make a difference. Alexander Stewart spoke about childcare costs, and I, I know that that makes a big difference to working families. Sometimes the difference between being able to work at all, but a five pound increase in child benefit would help pay for this for many families. Elaine Smith talked about how people in debt are in debt due to poverty and rightly challenged Jamie Halkuru Johnston, who suggested that help with budgeting was required. You cannot budget on nothing, as George Adams said. Alistair Allen quoted evidence given to the committee eh, by Russell Gunson, making the point that low incomes are impossible to budget. So while help with budgeting is fine, you do need something to budget with. The Cabinet Secretary, in our opening remarks, talked about Scottish choices. And we welcome the Scottish Government offering a twice monthly payment and giving funding di housing payments directly to landlords. However, surely people should also be able to have a weekly payment if that's what they want. It's very hard to make a small amount of money stretch over seven days, far less 14, and even worse, over a month. The, Scottish, the Cabinet Secretary also said there would be an option for split payments. Universal Credit currently makes one family payment, normally to the man in that family. Can I suggest to the Cabinet Secretary that split payments should be the norm? Because someone suffering coercive control cannot request a split payment from an abusive partner. They would never allow it. So unless it's the norm, we can do nothing to fight the control over finances that is part of domestic abuse and indeed something that this parliament legislated for. But also a default payment to a man enhances inequality. It promotes the view that the man should be in charge of the household finances. And surely that's something we all find unacceptable now. Presiding officer, we would do things differently we would remove the two-child cap and thereby the rate clause. We would top up child benefit by five pounds a week and we would pay a 10 pound living wage. This would lift people out of poverty and allow them to benefit from work with the confidence that they have a safety net below. Thank you very much. And I call Jeremy Balfour to close to the Conservatives. Seven minutes, please, Mr uh, Balfour. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, sum up uh, on behalf of a Conservative and welcome this debate um, this afternoon. In work poverty is defined as individuals living in households where the household income is below the poverty threshold, despite one member of a household working either full or part time. Scotland's level of work in work poverty is a critical problem that I think all of us can at least agree on this afternoon. The Scottish Conservatives want a welfare system that helps people into work supporting those who need our assistance. The previous system was complicated and often resulted in people losing money. And I was unclear for Mark Griffin whether he wants to go back to the old system or which was failing so many people who were working. If they are in work and people who are stuck on benefits ultimately costing the taxpayer more money. This is why implementing universal credit is essential in order to improve a previously failing system and ensure that those who are in work are benefiting from a much more effective and supportive system, saving hard-earned taxpayer money. I would like to re say it again, that tackling poverty needs to have a sustained and strategic approach. It will not happen overnight, nor will it be solved purely by the benefit system, as evidenced in the Social Security Committee's report. A bird's eye, all in compassion, all in compassion view of the factors that contribute to poverty must be taken if genuine improvement is to be made. Many policy areas require attention, such as the lack of opportunities for skills development in low-paid and part-time jobs, 
or the barriers that people with disabilities or caring responsibilities face in gaining employment. However, undoubtedly, the benefit system and universal credit has a significant part to play. And I do believe that some changes that have been made to universal credit, in particular, are a step in the right direction to see the reduction in work poverty that is needed. Can I reflect that across this chamber, today and also within this committee's report, too often evidence is ignored and simple political spin is put in its place. And that is a danger when we're discussing this area. And if we are to come to a balanced, correct view, we must look at all the evidence that was given to us and not just select the ones that we like. Absolutely. Alec Rowley. Evidence, it always strikes me that in 2010, I was not aware of any food banks in Scotland. Now we have food banks in most communities in Scotland. Does that not show that something has gone seriously wrong in terms of social and economic policy? Jeremy Balfour. Well, uh, firstly, I, I think I would challenge the question that there were no food banks in Scotland in 2010. But I think you, the comment you make is right, that there are lots of reasons why food banks have ex are existed now in Scotland, not just universal credit, and actually the economic factors and other policies pursued by this government are often leading to people having to come to universal credit. So I do agree that they are increasing, that is disappointment, but to lay that simply at the blame or at the door of universal credit, I think misunderstands the situation. As Michelle Ballantyne pointed out, one of the major changes that has been brought in is that benefits are now received under one umbrella benefit of universal credit. Previously, six benefits were received separately. Now they are rolled into one single payment paid directly into the claimant's bank account, which supports the development of a much simpler, efficient, streamlined benefit system, helping people to keep track of their money and manage their finances more effectively. I, I had one constituent come to me whose child um, is severely disabled, and she said to me, the, the change in having to only fill out one form compared to having to fill out six forms has made a massive difference to her life. Additionally, the option of having universal credit paid directly to a landlord is a welcome move, again in adding security and housing and allowing for a smoother renting experience for both the tenant and the landlord. I, I do think we have to be clear that we are moving towards a digital first approach one that the Scottish Government, I understand, is also going to roll out under the new social security system. And that is welcome. But there is a help there for people who do not have the IT skills, whether through personal intervention. Absolutely. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to the member for taking intervention. Just to be absolutely clear, the digital policy of Social Security Scotland bears no resemblance to that of the DWP because we recognise that there are concerns about a digital-only approach. Now, I'm pleased to say there are um, further improvements being made by the DWP, but I just want to put on record that we will not be running a system as the DWP currently does. Jeremy Balfour. I, I think, uh, thank you for coming to for intervention. I think you just have to be clear, though, it is not a digital-only approach that DWP run. You can telephone, you can text, you can have face-to-face -face interviews. And if you're telling us today, and I've been trying to clarify, if you're telling us today that the first port of call under if, when, when and if you get round to ever rolling out PIP and DLA is not going to be digital first, then I'd be really interested to hear that because that's not my understanding. Cabinet Secretary. Again, um, up to be absolutely clear, the application will be whatever the applicant wants it to be, whether it's by digital, whether it's by um, the telephone or whether it's by paper. It will be what the applicant wants because that's what the people with lived experience have told us that they want to see. Uh, Jeremy Balfour, you can make yeah. up, you'll let you make up your time. Yeah, well. I suspect paper and pen might be actually uh, out of use by the time that you get round to the interventum system. But I believe that it's important that the system must maintain a mixed approach, as I've said, which makes the personalised comfortable with whatever way they want to go ahead. Universal credit in, in practice has not been rolled out for a significant, significant period, as others have pointed out. Therefore, we cannot know for sure the full extent of the impact it's had. As with all new systems, there will be initial teething problems. Again, I'm interested that Labour's approach is uh, if something's not working, let's never change it. 
This system says if things are going wrong, we can change it without having to bring forward new legislation, which seems to me the correct way forward. The new benefit rollout is also working well in many areas. As Michelle Ballantyne pointed out earlier, 80% of people, that was the evidence that was given to the committee, 80% of people uh, is working for them. Now, I appreciate for the 20% we need to look at, we need to do it better, but to say that the whole system is failing is simply not correct. I believe universal credit is working to create what is needed and in the long term will be an effective in reducing those who experience in-work poverty. And I welcome this committee's uh, inquiry. I'm disappointed that the report didn't always follow the evidence and I think we need to continue to monitor the situation and see what's happened, not just what we think is happening, but it's actually what is happening in reality. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you very much. And I call on Eileen Campbell to close for the Government. Cabinet Secretary, eight minutes, please. Minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And like others, I want to thank all the members who contributed to this considered thoughtful and often a uh, reflective debate. And I want to particularly thank the work of the Social Security Committee who have created the space today to think about what further actions we as a parliament, as a government, need to do to create the fairer Scotland that I think most of us seek to create. And I want to thank them for their thorough inquiry that gathered opinion from a wide range of sources, including academics, think tanks, but perhaps more importantly, captured the voices and the stories of those with lived experience. Those people who are having to cope daily with the harsh realities of living in poverty, those people who know the harsh consequences of decisions that have been taken by a UK government that doesn't understand what it's like to live in poverty, or with low pay and whose decisions have not been routinely guided by the principles of dignity or respect. And it's those harsh realities that Alec Cole Hamilton spoke about that go beyond employment statistics or other facts and figures, the realities of the trauma and stress associated with poverty, the increased pressure on mental health and his description about associated connections with domestic abuse through universal credit being paid to a single claimant. Similarly, Keith Brown also described some of his constituents not being able to clothe their children and Alistair Allen spoke about his constituents having to survive on charity, debt and fresh air whilst they wait for their help. And presiding officer, there was an incredibly moving personal account from Mark Griffin who described how his parents worked hard providing for their family only to be rocked by the untimely passing of Mark Griffin's father. And in describing his own family, it showed how families can be vulnerable to significant change of circumstances, bereavement, relationship breakdowns, job losses, destabilising family security and income, and really needing the support the social security system should be there to offer. And that's where Claire Adamson's contribution was so important, because benefit payments and the unfortunate narrative that has developed around it, skivers, scroungers and the like, has hidden what social security should be. Not a transaction or an inconvenient budget line to be cut, but a safety net to help the most vulnerable and to protect all of us if we ever need to use it. And it's that safety net that is being dismantled by the UK government and today's contributions firmly further assert that to be the case. So it's right that the committee examine in-work poverty because it cannot be right that people who are doing all that society asks of them to work hard and to do their best should continue to have to work damn hard and never get out of the bit and continue to live in poverty. And the committee and members are right to highlight the impact and problems caused by universal credit because the UK government's assault on welfare benefits has played a significant role in increasing poverty levels both in and out of work. Their cuts estimated to reduce social security spending in Scotland by 3.7 billion by 2020, 2020, 2021 have removed many of the financial measures previously supporting families and locking them in poverty. And to put that 3.7 billion pounds into context, that is the equivalent to three times our annual police budget or the entire annual budget of NHS Glasgow and Lothian. But yet the UK government refused to fix the problems caused by their welfare reforms and that have been articulated today. And to coin a phrase, they refuse to test and learn their own feelings of their own policies. And the continued assault on welfare and the continued benefit cuts make it feel like we are continually fighting poverty with one hand tied behind our back. But we are not, as I've said in previous debates, sitting blithely by and letting welfare reforms hit the poorest hardest 
or hiding behind constitutional divisions. We are taking action. And that action has included significant decisions and concerted effort across government, not limited to particular portfolios, but instead responsive to the wide-ranging and reaching ways in which poverty impacts and it hits. Absolutely. Rhoda Grant. Um, can I ask then, if they're willing to take action, why they haven't taken action on the two-child cap? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm about to talk about the actions that we have taken and continue to take, and I think it would do well for the Labour Party to reflect on just what we are doing to help protect those that are being hit hardest by the significant welfare decisions being taken by another government, those that have been described as being outrageous and recognised as outrageous by her own party leader. And in 2018-19, we invested over 125 million to mitigate the worst impacts of austerity and to protect those on low incomes and help soften the blows landed on the most vulnerable by another government with differing priorities. 64 million for discretionary housing payments, 38 million for the Scottish welfare funds, which we know 13% is used due to benefit delays. We're investing in financial health checks to provide tailored advice for families on low incomes. We're spending three and a half million pounds for our fair food fund, supporting dignified responses to food insecurity. Moreover, we're spending six million pounds investment to deliver increased levels of school clothing grants, investing 25 million pounds on EMA, and we're providing 750 million to the Attainment Scotland Fund in this parliamentary term to help close the poverty-related attainment gap. But, presiding officer, our work won't stop there but instead seeks to pursue policies designed to respond to the needs of the people of Scotland. The Child Poverty Scotland Act enshrines our ambition to tackle unacceptable levels of child poverty and to build a better future and is backed by £50 million of the Tackling Child Poverty Fund. Within the plan, we set out a broad range of action to assist parents to increase their income from work and earnings. In April last year, we launched our newly developed devolved employability service, Fair Start Scotland, and to complement this, we have been committed to investing an additional £12 million in, in, in intensive employment support for parents and up to an additional £6 million to support disabled parents into uh, employment. Alongside this support, we're taking action to tackle low pay, even though the main levers that exist to tackle that don't exist here, but at a UK government level. Nevertheless, as a result of the action that we have without those levers, Scotland already has the highest rate of employees paid the real living wage in the UK at 80.6%. And we're working to lift a further 25,000 individuals onto this rate by 2021. And in the first year of our three-year strategy, we've already succeeded in securing increases for 5,000 individuals, making a real difference to their income. We're investing nearly £1 billion in the expansion of early learning and childcare, we have doubling funded provision to 1,140 hours by 2020. And members have also raised uh, the issue around the income supplement, and it was raised as part of the committee's inquiry, recognising the important role it will play in tackling poverty. Because social security is clearly one of the key drivers in reducing poverty and as such we committed to develop the income supplement providing additional financial support to low-income families guided by two key tests ensuring it targeted it was targeting those families who need it most helping to lift the maximum number of children out of poverty and with a robust and viable delivery route to get help to families and this is a significant commitment but it's not without its complexities and members should recognize that this is not a quick or easy fix and that is why my official are undertaking an analysis of potential policy and delivery options for the income supplement and the feasibility of those and I'll be providing an update on those out outcomes of that work to Parliament in June but myself and Shirley Ann Somerville will be discussing that in more detail with opposition spokespeople in the coming weeks but to close a uh, providing officer the, the cabinet is seconds, just closing sorry to close, in work poverty, poverty more generally, is unacceptable in a rich country like Scotland. Having folk rely on food banks, struggling with the basics, is not the measure of the country that I want. And as Cabinet Secretary and the Government in Scotland, and I and my colleagues will do all we can to create the type of country that we do want, fairer, equal with opportunities for all. But we will continue to mitigate where we can and soften the blows of a UK Government. Uh, but when even the UN recognises that devolved governments uh, having to mitigate UK welfare policies is outrageous, then we need to not, sh not be 
letting the Tory government off the hook. Instead, in the 20th anniversary of this parliament, we should seek to not simply be a government or a parliament of mitigation, but instead pursue policies to meet the needs of the people who put us here. In the meantime, we will do and continue to do all that we can to support those who need our help the most. Thank you very much. And I call on Bob Doris to close for the committee. Nine minutes, please, Mr Doris. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank all MSPs who have contributed to this afternoon's debate? Can I start by actually mopping up a couple of matters that I didn't get the opportunity to raise in my opening contributions? Firstly, and principally in relation to self-employed claimants, the committee asked for the UK government to urgently reconsider how UC claimant impacts on claimants who are self-employed. Under UC, people who are self-employed are subject to a gainful self-employment test and required to attend a job centre in order for this to be assessed. A minimum income floor is applied whereby after 12 months there is an assumed level of earnings, even if actual earnings are less. Self-employed people claiming universal credit are required to report earnings monthly instead of annually, as was the case with working tax credits. That's been a significant issue, presiding officer, and it would be remiss of me not to put that on the record in my closing contributions. I also wanted to stress our committee recommendation that the 2015 cut to the work allowance should be reversed not just reversed a bit by increasing that by £1,000, but reversed in its entirety. And I know uh, Mark Griffin also mentioned that during his contributions. And can I thank Alison Johnson for reinforcing her committee concerns regarding the monthly assessment period for universal credit. It's creating real and significant issues. Can I also use this as an opportunity, therefore, to put on record our committee's belief that the related aspect of surplus earnings thresholds. If you want more information, presiding officer, it's all in the report. But crucially, there's a temporary £2,500 threshold until April 2020, and it will disappear at that point. It can make a real difference. The committee believes that that should endure that threshold because it's of benefit to people. Um, I, I want to just reflect on one or two contributions we've had. E Elaine Smith and others mentioned uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund and also mentioned the Give Me Five campaign and ways that the Scottish Government can seek to mitigate the, the worst aspects of welfare reform. It's not for myself as committee convener to take a specific view on that, but to say that our committee will absolutely scrutinise that in the day-to-day -day work of our committee, and I absolutely give, give that guarantee. Can I also thank Tom Arthur for highlighting the lived experience of, of people who gave evidence to our committee, and that is absolutely crucial. Uh, and also, actually, Gordon Lindhurst for looking at the wider picture of issues in relation to in-work poverty. Although I would say gently to Mr Lindhurst, I don't think he actually engaged with the realities of universal credit, but he did paint some of that wider uh, picture. Um, Claire Adamson and Keith Brown, I would, I would like to comment in detail on their, in, in their contributions. I can't really, though, because that would probably make me digress from the committee report, but passionate speeches that are now, of course, on the record. And also to Alec Rowley, who quite rightly identified that you don't close job centres just as at a time where you're about to put additional burdens on job centre staff and put additional burdens and duties on those in in-work poverty. I think that's a, a very important point. To, to, to reinforce it there. Uh, I want to turn to transitional protections, and by that I mean those who would be on tax credits and are moved to universal credit under a managed migration. Uh, if some, put simply, I suppose, President Officer, if someone would be worse off by moving to universal credit, their income will be protected. They, they will be sustained until universal, universal credit catches up with what their current income is. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville uh, mentioned that, as did Alec O'Hamilton and Alex Rowley within their contributions. Now, those protections only exist unless there's a change of circumstances. Uh, those protections are lost without exception. And that would also include someone, if they were a victim of domestic abuse, they may be forced to have to choose between leaving an abusive partner or losing money. No exceptions. Our committee, and I think this is another point I want to make, our committee tried to get a consensual conclusion in relation to that across all party political boundaries, and we wanted to have the committee sign up to saying simply that that was disappointing. Now, a lot's been made about party politics in relation to this report, but can I say to the Chamber, we could not get our Conservative colleagues to sign up just to say the lack of those protections was disappointing. Uh, I, I'll leave it to others to, to judge where the party politics sits in relation to that. 
And I think I put on record the points that George Adam made, I think, in relation to that particular point. There was also an interesting exchange between myself and Michelle Ballantyne at the start of the debate, where Michelle Ballantyne was talking about evidence that the majority of people will be better off under universal credit. And I would just restate the committee recommendation. The committee observes when talking about social security support, the language referring to winners and losers can cause offence. Our social security systems must be designed to ensure everyone, everyone in need receives all the support they're entitled to. In other words, it's not about winners and losers, it's about supporting the most vulnerable. And I don't think it does the chamber any favours to then uh, use Russell Gunson as somehow cover for uh, the, 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 the Conservative position in relation to this. When Russell Gunson himself said that the changes to uh, tax credits and the move to universal credit with conditionality bears no relation to reality. That's what he, he told the committee. Uh, Presiding officer, I want to return to the elephant in the room, and that is the 50,000 uh, uh, people in work who are currently in receipt of universal credit, but also the 170,000 uh, who are currently on tax credits and are finishing a ma managed migration to universal credit. That will mean, currently as things stand, light touch conditionality, uh, which will at some point, I assume, mean there will simply be conditionality on all of those hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, this will impact on all of our constituents uh, who we know who are in work and who really don't consider in receipt of working tax credits and really don't consider themselves as part of the benefit system, but need the support of tax credits to go out to work to make ends meet. I suggest MSPs, uh, I suggest to them to that, that they should go to these constituents and they should say to those constituents, I think you should just increase your pay, you should just increase your hours of work, or you should just take a second job. Then tell them that if you don't think your constituents are trying hard enough, are trying hard enough uh, to do what you've asked them to do, that you will sanction them, that you will effectively dock their wages, you will effectively dock the wages of the working poor, if you like. Because effectively, that's what moving the tax credit system to the universal credit system under conditionality means. And that's what the committee rejected, with the exception of our Conservative members of that committee. Little surprise then that the committee firmly rejects moving to universal credit if in work conditionality remains. Little surprise that the PCS union, where most work coaches uh, are represented by, reject such sanctions also. And little surprise your committee share the PS PCS's concerns uh, regarding Job Centre Plus and DWP job losses and lack of resources. Uh, I should mention, of course, the UN Special Reporter, who doesn't have any party political uh, case to, to argue here. Uh, we were alarmed by Professor Alston's findings, which included, let me just put back on the record, British compassion for those who suffered, who are suffering has been replaced by a punitive, mean-spirited and often callous approach uh, that through it all, one actor has stubbornly resisted seeing the situation for what it is. The government, that is the UK government, has remained determinedly in a state of denial. Devolved authorities in Scotland and Northern Ireland are frantically trying to devise ways to mitigate, or in other words, counteract at least the worst features of the government's benefits policy. Our committee has written to Professor Alston with a view to holding an evidence session with him when his final report is available. Uh, but I have to say, there is a lived reality of welfare reform that we already know, and it impacts negatively in the most vulnerable of our constituents. This chamber knows that, our committee knew that, be it sanctions, be it a minimum five week wait for entitlement to benefits, be it the £3.7 billion reduction in income, mainly due to the benefits freeze, or be it reforms to the tax credit system and the move to universal credit with all of the dangers that I've outlined here this afternoon. Our committee looked at that evidence and we have concluded that as things stand, universal credit is simply not fit for purpose to protect the working poor. We were able to unite as a committee, almost, unfortunately we couldn't get our Conservative members on board, but we will continue and endeavour to stand up for the working poor where we can, not just to the UK government, but in certain calls to the Scottish government, including the idea of an income supplement and the responsibilities they have in relation to tackling in-work poverty. And I thank the presiding officer and members for contributing to this afternoon's debate. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on social security and in-work poverty.
Uh, we'll turn now to the next item of business, which is, uh, and I'm pleased to call uh, Claire Adamson, convener of the Education and Skills Committee, to make an announcement on nas Scottish national standardised assessments. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, for this opportunity to highlight to Parliament, on behalf of the Education and Skills Committee, a report on Scottish and national standardised assessments. The committee agreed to undertake the inquiry on evidence base for the recently introduced Scottish national standardised assessments. Uh, in literacy, numeracy, numeracy and in primary one, primary four, primary seven and S3. It's a unanimous committee report and includes a series of recommendations, some of which I wish to draw to the attention of the chamber this afternoon. The committee notes that evidence from certain witnesses to the inquiry reflected that the Scottish Government announced the policies quickly without meaningful, meaningful collaboration with certain key stakeholders or establishing an in-depth evidence base for elements of the policy. And the committee considers that the Scottish Government should reflect on this evidence and learn lessons for future policy development. We examined whether the assessments are low-stake assessments. And we make recommendations to seek to prevent them from becoming medium stakes, for example, seeking checks and balances from the inspectorate. And the committee also recommends that the Scottish Government and its agencies acknowledge explicitly the summative function of the assessments in future communications. We were interested in the cost of the policy, including the estimate for cost over five years and details of the basis of an overspend. We are also seeking an assessment of the likely reduction in the use of local authority standardised assessments and the end to the first three academic years of SNSAs and the associated saving at local, local government level. We recommend that the Scottish Government undertakes an assessment of the workload implication for teachers and other school staff. At local authority level, the committee had positive evidence of the tangible examples of how SNSE data is contributing towards improvements and would welcome an update from ADIS on the further examples of the, at the end of the academic year. On national performance data, including the replacement of the SSLN with the achievement of curriculum for excellence levels, the committee was concerned that the decisions on the national performance data may have left a gap of up to five years with no guarantee that that gap will not be any longer. We also examined ITC implications in relation to data literacy and these and other recommendations I would encourage members to, to look to the report to see our detailed examination of these areas. We look forward to receiving the government's response on this important issue and can I close by thanking sincerely all those who contributed to the work of the committee and the clerks for their support. Thank you. Thank you very much, convener. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 17023 in the name of Graham Day. Uh, setting out changes to this week's business. And could I call on Graham Day to move the motion on behalf of the Bureau? Move, the Presiding Officer. Now, any member who wishes to speak against or for the motion may do so now. Uh, could I call Morris Golden? Uh, presiding Officer, in today's news alone, we read that school subject choice is in crisis, that nearly half of infrastructure projects are late, that there is an inquiry into cancer care in Tayside. These are the things that really matter. Schools, the economy, hospitals. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon wants to give a statement, not about schools, the economy or hospitals, but about a second independence referendum. She is making her priorities absolutely clear. So let me be equally clear. We want to move on from the SNP's constitutional grandstanding. And we will get back to the things that matter to the people of Scotland. And so we will vote against the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Golden. And I call Graham Day to respond on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Presiding officer, in seeking to oppose the business motion, the Conservatives are arguing against the government providing this parliament and the country as a whole with an update which seeks to bring order and clarity amidst the chaos and confusion which their own Brexit policy has created. 
There is a widespread expectation, based on undertakings given by the First Minister, that the Government will provide an update on its thinking regarding Brexit, its implications for Scotland and this country's constitutional future. Indeed, the First Minister gave a specific undertaking in this chamber, replying to Patrick Harvey on the 17th of January that she would provide such an update even in the event of the Article 50 process being extended. That extension has now been granted. It was agreed while this Parliament was in recess, and so this week provides the first opportunity since then to provide the promised update. Presiding officer, the basis upon which the government is seeking to proceed is not only rational and sensible, it's the mark of a government fulfilling its responsibilities to this Parliament and the wider country. Yeah. And, presiding officer, we will take no lessons from the Tories when it comes to getting on with the day job. Thank you. The question is that motion 17023 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17023 in the name of Graham Day is yes, 83, no, 31. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 17024 on a committee membership substitution. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And we'll turn to decision time now. The first question is that motion 16957 in the name of Bob Doris on social security and in-work poverty be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 17024 in the name of Graham Day on a committee membership substitution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members business in the name of Claire Baker on the Open University at 50. We'll just take a few moments for members and uh, ministers to change seats. <laughs> 